Hello. Good morning, everyone. How are we all feeling? Good? Yeah? I see a nod. Someone feels good. That's good. Uh, my name is Julia Hatmaker, and I'm the deputy editor at Place Northwest. I'm going to be your host for today's conference, Place Resi. I hope you guys are all excited to talk about all things residential. I know I am, and we have an awful lot to talk about. We're in the midst of a housing boom right now, which I know all of you know, but the industry is still being impacted by construction costs, uh, we're also got the skills shortage, so now is not the time to get complacent. So we've got two great presentations and panels today. We're gonna to be talking about affordability. We're also gonna be talking about the future of the sector. So not only will we be establishing where the market is today, we'll also be talking about where it's going in the future. So first off, I just do wanna take a moment to thank our sponsors because without them, none of this would be possible, including those amazing croissants. I don't know if anyone else had one this morning, but they were awesome. Uh, so special thanks to Trowers and Hamlins, Close Brothers Property Finance, WSP, BECG, Clear Fiber, and Opid in Life. Can I get a round of applause for them, please? Thank you so much. And if you have not had a chance to this morning, during our breaks, be sure to go out and check out the exhibition from G Builder. They're a construction tech firm and they're here exhibiting today from Finland and they're amazing and really cool. They're actually right over there. So be sure to check them out. Now, I need you all to pull out your phones, if you don't mind. I'm not gonna tell you to silence them, although that might actually be a pretty good idea. What I want you to do, though, is to download the Place Northwest app, if you have not done so already. This app is basically today's event bible. It's got the agenda, it's got your speaker bios, it's got a really fun way in which you can connect with people that you meet today and exchange contact info. It's also got Slido which is our very cool technology that allows you to ask questions to our panels. So when you get into the app, you're just gonna make sure you use the code PNWRESI to get access to all of that. If you don't really wanna do the whole app thing, you can go online to sli.do and submit your questions that way. Uh, the code as well for that is PNWRESI. All right, I think that's like the main order of business I had to do, which is good. Um, da, 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 da. All right, that is enough of me. So I'm gonna start bringing up our first presenter, Hilary uh, Brett Parr. She is one of the founding members of Far East Consortium's Manchester office, and she's the project director overlooking much of the four billion pound Victoria North master plan, which we'll be seeing roughly 15,000 new homes created in the city. Hilary, they're all yours. All right, thank you so much. me. Um, okay. Hi, everyone. Nice to see you. Um, I don't think I've been in a room with so many people since, and I was trying to think when I was sat there. It was probably Mojo's December 2019. It was probably the last time I've uh, seen so many faces. Um, but yeah, I, I'm here today to talk about um, uh, Victoria North. And I was thinking when I was putting the presentation together that all the times that FEC have spoken before at conferences, it's all about what we are planning to do and what our strategic ideas are and all the hypotheticals around that. And I wanted to use today really to speak about what we have done since we formed our joint venture partnership with Manchester City Council and what are the key challenges and the issues that we're going to be overcoming over the next 10, 15 years. Um, I'll just pop onto the next slide. So yeah, so um, all of these challenges are really exciting for us. They're difficult challenges and they need partnership working, but um, I'm hope, hoping that um, some of the dialogue that we have after my presentation today will touch on some of those issues. Okay. So just a bit of background and just to put the context, hopefully people have heard about Victoria North in this room. Uh, I know I've worked with a lot of the people in this room today, but um, it's our 50-50 um, joint venture partnership with Manchester City Council. And this slide here, and I love this image, and we show this image quite a bit, that shows the scale of the opportunity relative to Manchester City Centre. So it's a 150-acre um, site, site which is um, going north from Victoria train station, and it is um, delivering 15,000 new homes on brownfield land. So it is one of the biggest regeneration projects outside of London, and it's it's key really to Manchester's, well, one of the key projects for Manchester's economic recovery coming out of the pandemic. So a lot of our focus on and a lot of the narrative that we have around it is 
revitalizing existing communities and a catalyst for regeneration in North Manchester. If people know that area of the city, it's um, home to the Collyhurst community, which is subject to um, a lot of cleared sites and there needs significant investment in there. And it's also areas of the city where there's significant contamination um, and flood risk and a whole host of issues for, for us to overcome. Um, we developed um, a city regeneration framework, which was endorsed by the City Council in February 2019, um, which sets out our aspirations across this neighbourhood, which talks about seven interconnecting neighbourhoods, bringing together the existing communities and also creating new communities. And it's really about creating a mix of housing and creating desirable places that people want to live. Um, and it's also this, uh, our key theme, I suppose, that runs through the Northern Gateway is about the City River Park. So that is um, the, the green space that knits all these seven communities together, um, like the golden thread, although I was thinking, is it more of a green thread? But yes, it's a green thread that, that pulls these neighbourhoods together and it, and it promotes healthy living, walking, cycling. So all of that, hopefully, is not new news to anybody in this room because we've been talking about uh, Victoria North, formerly Northern Gateway, for um, four years. But since, since our partnership with Manchester City Council, we, um, in 2017, we in the Manchester office have grown significantly and we've s invested probably over 100 million in the city to date. Um, and so this slide just sort of picks up on some of that progress that we've done to date. So our Meadowside scheme, um, which is around Angel Meadows uh, Park um, near the Noma Estate in the city. So we've been on, on site with our first plot that PC'd in August this year. And if anybody is a fan of traditionally laid brickwork, I would recommend you go out and look at, at our Mount Yard site because the, the, it, it looks fantastic. We've got our plot two and three, which is the gate installed. They're due to be completed at the end of 2021. Um, and we have another site which we're, we're looking to start on site in the next couple of years. So we've, you know, we've really been, our first scheme in the city, we've really been progressing on that and we're now happy to have our customers, our, the new residents moving into those buildings. And then taking Victoria North, our phase one of Victoria North, what have we been doing on that? Yes, we've heard about the interconnecting neighbourhoods, we've heard about your strategic framework. So we've really been focusing on trying to get moving on our phase one. So uh, New Cross Central, which is an 80-unit scheme in, in, in New Cross, is on site. That's due for completion in 2021. So, um, and um, this, this the end of this year. Um, and Victoria Riverside, which is um, our 634-unit scheme, which is the first um, scheme within our Red Bank neighbourhood. That's uh, recently. Um, been uh, announced that we partnered with L and Q Trafford Housing on affordable housing on that site, and again we're, we've started on that site and we're looking to complete by 2024. And again, another hugely important aspect of our delivery in Victoria North is in Collyhurst. So we are doing an enabling works package. We have planning consent for 270 homes, um, with you know a huge proportion of those being council homes, and um, we're, we're really moving ahead in Collyhurst as well. And I think that was. When we, when we came forward with our phase one strategy, it's always been important for us in Victoria North to start both ends, so to both look at the city centre fringe, so our Victoria, Riverside and New Cross schemes, but also to go up into the existing communities and start building um, trust within those communities. So our first phase in Collyhurst is 270 homes, and it's, it's really for us to show our intention and to get support and buy-in from the neighbourhoods to... To, to our plans in that area, um, and um, and it's hugely important for us, equally as, as, as important as our city centre schemes. Um, and one thing that I've, I haven't put on this slide, but also which has been, you know, really a real catalyst for us and, and something that we've achieved in our first four years is th through the partnership with Manchester City Council, we've secured £51 million worth of housing infrastructure funding, which is to unlock the Red Bank neighbourhood, which will be the focus for the the rest of my presentation, which is um, really to unlock over 5,000 homes in that area, which is, um, which, is, which is massive for the city and a real success for the City Council and us to, to be able to, to secure that funding. Um, it has a really tight funding deadline. We need to get it all spent by March 2024. I know some of the project team are in, in the room today. Don't know why they're here. Shouldn't they be getting that money spent? Um, but yeah, it's all around sorting out the flooding issues there, contamination, facilitating access to 
the, the majority land ownership that's, that's controlled by, by the city and uh, FEC. So then I just wanted to focus on Red Bank. So my role at FEC is, is to lead on our high density, high rise schemes and our city fringe um, schemes. And Red Bank to me is hugely important to the city, hugely important to me personally, massively important to S FEC as to what sort of legacy that we're gonna be creating in that neighborhood. Um, so yeah, it's amazing what we've done today. What I just cantered through quickly, I've only got 15 minutes and you know, we've, we've done quite a lot in, in four years, is, is, really, um, is really fantastic. But what is next for us and the focus now, although we've got, you know, we will be doing subsequent phase in Collyhurst, the focus now is, for me, is, is what we're doing in Red Bank. And um, we went out to the market, um, did a design competition at the beginning of this year, and we've appointed McCrane and Lavington and Shorts Grasshoff, who are international um, designers who've got a specialist in environment and sustainability. And that really then has helped shape our ideas about what we're going to be doing within Red Bank. Um, and everything I'm going to show you is very much a work in progress. It's very much, you know, we're engaging with the city, we're sort of engaging with other partners to develop ideas. We need to go out and do the public consultation, but, but some of these ideas we feel are really fantastic and I wanted to sort of share with you because it really highlights some of the challenges that we're going to be facing in this neighbourhood. Um, so McCrae and Lavincombe have come up with this idea called Wild Urbanism for the neighbourhood. So it's about bringing nature into the city along the River Irk and it's also about bringing the city into this emerging neighbourhood, into the green space that already exists within our city but we just don't go there at the moment because it's the wrong side of the tracks I suppose, that part of the city. Um, it's, it will um, amplify the landscape and the ecology, and it also you know, creates sort of a neighborhood that probably is not really like anywhere else that you'd live in the, um, in the city. So this is just a snapshot of our illustrative master plan that we're working on. Like I said, there's a huge amount of work that we do need to go through to, to develop this, but I, hopefully what this image shows you is, um, it shows you about our importance and the value that we're going to be putting on green space. So when you put together the, the green space, the streets, the public realm, it's probably going to be about 50% development and 50% green space, open space. And importantly, it includes the first phase of the City River Park, the City River Park that we've been talking about, which is fundamental to Victoria North, and it's been at the heart of our aspirations when we've spoken about the project previously. So at the heart of that, and it's facilitated by this important HIF funding and, and MCC's investment in the, in the, um, in the neighbourhood, but it, it, it's all focused around the park and it's focused around um, green space, connecting communities and homes into that green space. So um, I've put some key figures down at the bottom of, of the slide there. So we're looking at approximately 4,000 new homes on the joint venture owned land. So that's land under control of FEC and of um, Manchester City Council. And it's, I mean, we've got the HIF funding, which is, you know, 50 million is, is fantastic. That's probably less than half of what we need to just unlock some of the infrastructure burdens that we've got in the area. And, um, and you know, I've put the, 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 the estimated total GDC um, on there, uh, around 1.2 billion investment in this area, and, it, and it's massive, it's, it's gonna cost a lot. Um, but I think what's important for us is that we create this community, and we create this neighborhood focused around the green space, focused around healthy living, prioritizing active travel, prioritizing active lifestyles, all of the things that people had time to reflect on in the pandemic and all the things that are going to be driving what our customers want and where our customers want to live in the future, we think it's like hugely important that that is, even in our thinking now, it forms part of the narrative around our neighbourhood. You'll hear me talk about it it's in subsequent slides, but FEC as an organisation is hugely infused by zero carbon. Don't tell me how we're going to get there because I'm not a specialist. I think when I said at the beginning of this presentation, it's all about partnership working. We, we, FEC know how to build and sell private residential properties. That's our, that's our specialism. That's what we do. We need, we need input from others to help us understand what being zero carbon and what creating a zero carbon neighborhood means to us. Um, and so I think we're enthused by it. We make bold statements about it, but we're on a, we're on a journey there to get to to get to to get to that being you know achieved within our neighborhood um i suppose the other thing just to just to, to touch on here is just our 
ambition in terms of our delivery plan. So this is a 10-year delivery plan for just this neighbourhood alone. So we're looking at 400 homes per annum coming forward uh, within the neighbourhood. That's aside from what we're doing in Collyhurst and in, in the other parts of Victoria North. So what's really important to us in this neighbourhood is the mix of tenure and the type of homes that we deliver. And, um, and that is that mix of affordable, private, built to rent, other types of, of tenures. That's really important for us to be putting into this neighbourhood. We don't want to create an exclusive neighbourhood. It's important for us that we have a, the whole cross-section sec, cross of society within this neighbourhood. Um, and then I've got just a little bit of an image here, which is a hand sketch of, of, of what we're talking about. Like I said, it's a work in progress. It's, um, it, sort of, but it sort of sets out what we're talking about when we say extension of the city and green space. So this is high density living. It is um, an extension of the city centre. It is in green space. But all important to that is living in the park, not just by a park. And it's also important to have um, a huge mix of housing types within that. So our aspiration is um, moving on from our Victoria Riverside scheme, which is a tower scheme um, with, with podium uses, um, to more of a range, a range of family housing and, um, and, and on the plateau having more of a focus on, on, on family living. Um, so yeah, I suppose like I just wanted to sort of set out the vision about what, what we're thinking about for Red Bank and what we're thinking about for the neighbourhood because that really leads me on to talking about some of the, what, the three key issues that we're trying to resolve. The key challenges and, and myself and, and Gavin who I work with we were talking about how do we explain these challenges because they're not a negative thing, they're fantastic, they're an opportunity for us but they are something that we really need to grapple with. So. The first issue, and I've touched on it, is uh, to do with our housing type and tenure. So I've put on here, hopefully you can see it at the back of the room. So I have put in here how we, where we are up to in terms of our Victoria North phase one. So my slide at the beginning that was saying, wow, fantastic, this is what we've done. I've split it down between the total number of homes, where that sits in terms of the affordable delivery. And as you can see from the slide, we are delivering around 26% overall affordable housing within the plots that we're bringing forward. And that is a mix of different affordable types. And I put the, the second bullet point down is what is affordable housing? And quite often we're asked by members of the press and elsewhere, is it really affordable? Um, and that as a private developer is not really something that I can answer. I work within the constraints of the definition of affordable housing that's to, you know, set out by the government and set out by Manchester City Council in terms of the average uh, income that, that people earn. So we respond to that, we don't set that. So, um, but what we do recognise within that, although we're not defining affordable housing, is it's important to have a mix of affordable housing. And you can see on, our, on this slide here that um, 50% of the affordable housing that we deliver is actually social rent in our phase one. So we're delivering 130 social rented homes in Collyhurst in partnership with the City Council. And as I touched on at the beginning, how important it is for us to build the relationships with the community and, and to put back some of the, 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 um, the social rent council houses that they've lost um, through previous demolitions. We're also looking at other forms of affordable, which is probably more appropriate for city centre locations. So um, we, um, you may have seen in the press, I just mentioned earlier, that we did a fantastic deal with L&Q Trafford Housing Trust on our Victoria Riverside scheme where one of the towers is going to be all affordable and that will be a mix of shared ownership and uh, rent to buy. Um, and then I've also put in here the, the housing mix, the split down between um, houses and apartments. And I think it works out, I was just doing a quick calculation again when I was sat there, that around 26% of the homes are um, family homes, so they're houses or three bed apartments, so the larger type, type homes. Um, and I think that's really important for us um, when we are thinking about how we how we move forward in Red Bank. What is the mix of the size of homes that we're providing in Red Bank? And what is the mix of between the affordable and the private and the BTR? And I think, I mean, I don't have the answers to this. I, I wanted to set it out as a, one of the challenges that we're facing. We um, went out to the market in summer last year and we appointed a panel of uh, RPs to help us deliver on the Red Bank Affordable. So we're working with Guinness, Great Places and L&Q Trafford Housing. 
um, to help us inform some of our thinking, to help us focus on what type of tenure and what type of homes uh, we should have um, within this neighbourhood. And I've just included some of the images at the bottom when I talk about family living in high density. It's quite an unusual concept, I think, for the UK to think that you would be raising your family so close to the city centre um, and not moving to the suburbs where you have a, a, gar a front and back garden and a drive. And some of these images are, are schemes in, in Copenhagen, at Copenhagen at, and, and in Europe where it's common for you to live in a, in a, in a city centre or very close to a city centre and raise your family. Um, you have you know, great access to open space, the social infrastructure that, and, and schools and healthcare that supports you living there with your family. So we're really working with McCrane and Lavington to think about what type of family housing that is still high density and will appeal to our customers that, that we can put within, within this neighbourhood. Um, so yeah, and I suppose the last point I've, I've put on there is uh, developing partnerships to support delivery. We, we emphasise it again, FEC is, is, is a, our, our spe specialism is developing private for sale resi. We don't have all the answers to, to how we do the, the BTR and how we do affordable, but we need to tap into the market and get the best intelligence to help inform what we're doing in Medbank because it's really crucial to the success of the neighbourhood that is a diverse community and success for us as a developer we need to make money that's a fundamentally we're a developer and that's our you know one of our objectives we need to therefore appeal to a wide range of people a wide customer base that helps with our digestion as we're delivering 400 new homes per year so the second challenge that we've been uh, wrestling with in Medbank is this idea of place shaping. So I get told off by an architect if I call it place making, so I'm trying to call it place shaping now because of course Red Bank and that area of the city is already a place. It already has existing businesses that are important for us to retain there. It al already has a valley that's, you know, um, and a river and, and really important green space within that area. And it already has heritage features. So we're not creating a place from scratch. We're shaping this place to, to make it suitable and, uh, and support this, this new community that we, that we want to build. So alongside that, and I think you probably would have picked up on it, our drive to have bigger homes, family living, you can't have that without having supporting social infrastructure. So we're actively engaging conversations about a, a new primary school. We're act actively considering where health centres will go in this neighbourhood. It's going to be a population of around 8,000 new people or new or, or relocated people within, within that area. And you can't have that neighbourhood without having all these, these, these other, um, other inf supporting infrastructure that you need. And also fundamental to that is having supporting cultural amenity and commercial uses. So again, we're considering what is our commercial strategy is going to be here? What sort of anchor tenants might we want to attract this area? Where are suitable uses within the neighbourhood? We don't want to put a lot of noisy, you know, unsociable uses up on the plateau where we have family homes. That's more suitable for healthcare and, and, and education uses. So all of that we're thinking about and all of that we're sort of trying to, to, to engage with the market to help inform our thinking. Um, again, and you, you know, the, the, this whole um, emphasis on healthy living activity and fitness. Um, within, our, within our master plan, we're, um, considering including what we're calling a climate loop, which is effectively a 1.5 kilometre route within the neighbourhood through the parklands, which means that you don't need to cross any roads and it's safe for cycling and walking. And you can live in that neighbourhood and go out and use this route for your daily walk, your daily cycle. It's safe from cars. It's safe from, you know, pollution, air quality issues. You're, you're within this route and you can, um, you can use that for you know, for your fitness and activity, and you're going to have access to high quality public realm and green spaces. So whilst we're trying to sort of get to grips with what's the social infrastructure, what are these amenity uses, we're also thinking about the long term. How are we going to manage, appropriately manage these amazing spaces that we're putting in, these, this amazing parkland that, that we want to be exemplary? How, how are we going to do that? And like, what is, the, what is the structure that sits around managing those areas? Because it isn't going to be an adopted area it's going to have to be privately managed because to, re to reach the aspirations that I'm talking about we need to think about different different ways of doing that again I don't have the answer to that I'm highlighting to you some of the issues that we're, we're grappling with and, and then and lastly yeah using the, the topography and the historical assets to shape our neighborhood 
um, there is actually a, a level difference of 15 metres from the bottom of the site to the top of the site. We're grappling with all those types of issues to then how do we make the site accessible if you're travelling and traversing such dif difficult gradients. So, so all of that is feeding in really to our, um, to our thinking around how we, we shall shape the place. And then last but not least um, is our, um, uh, the carbon strategy that we're thinking about for the neighbourhood. As I've said at the start, we're really enthused by zero carbon. We, we've set an aspiration for our design team that we want the, 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 the neighbourhood to be zero carbon in operation. Um, and we want to make good carbon decisions. We, we're quite aware that it's going to be very difficult for us to reach zero carbon in construction, embedded carbon, because we're building high-rise buildings made of concrete but what can we do to make careful decisions in our construction process so we're not for example assuming everything needs to be triple glazing because that helps us in the zero carbon in operation but fundamentally has more embedded carbon within the within the, the, the construction element of it so we want to make we want to make good decisions around that and we want to to to, to get the best ideas to how we how we come up with a strategy and, and what that means in terms of uh, in terms of our our delivery, um, but, but there's other things around our sustainable neighbourhood: biodiversity, resilience of the park, um, creating this healthy community, and also living within a five-minute neighbourhood. All of those are super important for creating a sustainable neighbourhood, and all of the things that I've touched upon in relation to the issues that we're grappling. And I've not mentioned the word, but obviously it's there, the viability of our scheme. We're trying to do affordable. We are trying to achieve zero carbon. We are trying to create this place. All of that has a huge pressure on, on the viability of our scheme. And I, and I think that the HIF funding that we've, we've, um, we've secured, the 50 million, has, has been really important to ha help unlock and be a catalyst to start us moving in, in this neighbourhood. But there's a lot of issues around the viability that we need to overcome by thinking about innovative ways of doing things and also thinking and partnership, making partnerships with people that can help unlock some of these challenges for us. And, you know, obviously with zero carbon and, and, and um, the carbon strategy, we're in a, in a, you know, a fluctuating state of policy and regulation requirements that as this is a 10 year build program that we will need to respond to. So whatever program and strategy we come forward it needs to be resilient resilient as we move through um, we move through the um, we move through the development program so that was a whistle stop tour of um, the scheme but hopefully like you can see that we've got huge ambition for this neighborhood uh, it, there's a lot long way for us to go there's a long way for us to, to develop some of these strategies but we we've never been and us as a company and us as a local office, we don't want to shy away from that. We want to step forward and embrace some of these challenges. I mean, you know, this, some of the challenges that we've, we've had in our phase one on Victoria Riverside and on Collyhurst, we want to, to face them front on and we want people around us to support them and partner with us to help us unlock some of the issues. So hopefully that was enlightening and uh, interesting, but uh, that's all. Cheers. Hilary, that was fantastic. Thank you so much for sharing. Uh, if, can I have my panel please take, take to the panel area, the panel stage? So um, I think one of the things I found really interesting about the panel uh, presentation though, Hilary, was about how you were talking about the three major issues with affordability being uh, net zero and trying to ambition for that and also the idea of place shaping. I know that all three of those topics are going to come up in our panel discussion. So we've got three great panelists. Joining Hillary is Doug Han with WSP. He's a director there and a town planner with more than 20 years of experience in both the public and private sectors. Doug, just, can, can you wave so they know which one you are? That's okay? Doug, Doug does not wave. Okay, so next we've got Nicola Rigby, a principal at Avison Young, and the lead on the company's Northwest Development and Regeneration team. Nicola, thank you so much for joining us. Unfortunately, we did have a fourth panelist, but they had to drop out uh, yesterday, basically last minute, but I think we're going to have a really good panel regardless. That being said, given who we have on the stage now, I'm sure our questions from the audience will go past affordability, and that's okay. So if you do want to submit a question to the panelist, or if you want to kind of ask a bit more about the presentation that we just saw, you can do that at Slido. Again, that's on the Place Northwest app. I will keep plugging this, this entire conference. It's also at sli.do, and the code is PNWresi. All right, so first question first. I'm just going to go, I'm going to go big 
because that's exciting to me. So what are the major issues impacting the delivery of affordable homes? Doug, why don't you start that one? Okay, um, well, morning everybody. Um, I think the, the challenge of affordable housing, it, it's multifaceted and it, there's no one easy answer. Um, we as planners hold um, some of the solutions, um, but there's, there's key demand and supply side factors affecting delivery. I think it, it, in terms of one key factor, I'd say it surrounds viability and delivery at the minute. Um, Hillary just touched on it. The, in terms of delivering developments, whether they're main city centre developments or, or, or suburban or even greenfield sites, there's a lot of demands in terms of policy requirements for social infrastructure. There's demands around design quality. There's demands around uh, mitigation um, and demands around carbon. And when you add all those factors together, um, it, it squeezes viability. And in the current process, with Section 106 is providing for affordable housing, they inevitably get squeezed in the, in the equation and affordable housing contributions get squeezed down or in some cases out. And we all work hard to try and deliver as much as possible, but it, it's those demanding competing pressures of delivering what are often difficult sites, as we just heard with, with, with um, places like Hollyhurst, it's delivering those challenging sites and actually being able to provide the affordable housing. And some of that comes down to, to expectations of land value, um, some of it comes down to expectations around policy and other requirements and, and what are the priorities for the community, the councils and, and developers. But it, it, it's a complex equation, but I'd say viability is one of the key challenges. Yeah, Nicola, do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, morning everyone. Um, I think, um, just actually reflecting on what both Hilary and Doug have already said, um, just, just in terms of those two, I suppose, um, the, the two ends of the spectrum in terms of the work that the FEC are doing with affordable housing partners at, at Red Bank and at Collyhurst and the, the challenges that Doug's just talked about, I think there's something about where are the registered providers and the housing associations within the development process. So, uh, you know, the idea of going through, taking a site through a development process, securing planning permission, uh, predetermining what that affordable product is going to be through that process and then looking for a partner to implement it is a, is a break in the system. And actually when you think about, um, you know, we've been uh, working with FEC on, on the affordable housing discussions at Red Bank and where there's real value is bringing that earlier into the discussion to be informing what should the affordable housing be, um, what, what type of product should it be, what type of tenure should it be, as Hillary's already talked about, and building in that viability right from the start of the process, getting a really a more sound understanding as an industry more generally in how um, affordable housing is genuinely delivered, how we can maximise access to grant to increase affordable housing within general development programmes. So I think um, there's something about a disconnect within the market, how close we are to the registered provided market, and actually just from an industry perspective, you know, preaching to the converted people in this room, but that RP market is just going to get bigger and bigger in terms of how it plays as actually a, effectively a, a mainstream residential developer over the next few years. So now is the time for us to really get to grips with understanding properly who they are, how they operate, how they access funding, how they model viability and make sure we're building that into the development process earlier um, to, to effectively deliver more. Yeah, and I'm, I'm really glad you mentioned funding because I know that's a huge aspect of this, you know, of making these schemes happen. Hillary, you talked a little bit about how Red Bank received some giant capital funds. Can you just tell a little bit more about the government's role in kind of making these schemes viable? Yeah, I mean, I think it's hugely important that, um, that these major capital funding programs continue. And I think for us, um, when we're delivering something over a long time, uh, time scale like we're doing at, at Red Bank and in Victoria North that we don't have to continuously go through funding rounds, funding bids, we're waiting to find out whether there's going to be uh, you know, uh, uh, the ability to, for us to bid into something and the process around that. When you're looking at something that is a you know, a 10 to 15 year plus program, we want the ability to re recycle finance opportunities, to have a, you know, a, a funding pot that we can secure with the government and that is really really important to unlocking the brownfield sites that we have and i know you know there's a huge pressure and huge debate around um you know green belt release greenfield sites because there's less issues around viability but you need to have this access to government funding really to to enable some of our sites and i and i touched upon in my presentation yes we have the 50 million pounds 
worth of HIF funding, which is fantastic. But it's you know it's just the you know the tip of the iceberg for what we're going to need. And I think um, it's brilliant. And, and Nicola touched on it that RPs can access the grant funding for affordable homes um, that allows them to, to deliver the, the affordable um, the, the affordable homes. But that's just that's not everything for the developer. We still need to, to resolve our viabilities of bringing forward schemes on really complex sites. Um, so. Yeah, and I know earlier we talked a little bit about the mix of tenure, and you touched on that in your presentation as well. Doug, I know when we had a little discussion before today's event, you said one of the big things that was facing affordability was getting that mix of tenure right and actually meeting where people needed it to be. And I think you said social rent might be one of the categories that needs to be addressed more. Yeah, I mean, I think it, it, the mix of affordable housing, and Hillary touched on it, I mean, what, it, what is affordable housing? It, it, it's a broad church in terms of types and tenure. And just looking recently at the MHCLG data for 2019-20, we delivered about 57,000 affordable units in the country, which is great. 66% um, were rented, which again, really targets the market. Um, but of those, 82% uh, were delivered by RPs. So that gives you a, a clue that um, the RP sector, as we just heard, is, is key in delivering them. But when I look at the, the recent planning changes of first homes coming in, with 25% um, of affordables to be first homes, that's squeezing the other ability to deliver other tenures. Um, and I think it, it, it's key that quite a lot of first homes are not going to meet the affordable needs of many communities because they won't have access to buy homes um, there as, as we've heard it this morning are focused at, at, at you know lower median incomes and they're not going to be in that market therefore there's a real danger that, that in, in pushing the home ownership which the government's keen on doing they are actually going to compress the ability to deliver some of that rented product um, whether it's, it's social rent affordable rent um, etc and I think there's a real danger that um, we may end up not meeting um, some of the most acute affordable needs, um, but able to, to, to target some of those needs which are probably easier to achieve and would find their own way through the market. Can yeah, Nicola, you got thoughts on that? that? Sorry, I, mean, yeah. I, think, I think this is a really important area to talk about because yeah, I think there's a real um, sort of stigma around affordable rental product, uh, affordable rent, social rent product, um, and, and that's you know, one reason why there's been such an increase in, in shared ownership and, and rent to buy products over the last few years. And I think, again, it comes down to this, this real important trust issue between the private market and um, the affordable housing market, the RP market. The reason why social rent, I think, is so challenging in a, a wider project delivery context is traditionally there's a lot less control over who is renting those products. And a lot of um, RPs get lumped with housing issues that the rest of the market isn't prepared to deal with. So we work with lots of registered providers who, where they have vacant stock, are under a lot of pressure to house homeless people or bring in short-term letting policies because they have to drive value through the assets that they own. They've got huge pressures within their business plans to be generating income, allowing them to invest in the rest of the stock and take on new development in the future. So this idea of um, needing to make sure that we're still delivering meaningful social rent and affordable rent. We've got to get to the heart of understanding the lettings policies that registered providers operate under and work with them as an industry to create that trust and create that dynamic and be delivering in partnership where the market can have a, a role and a relationship in setting some of those policies and, and some of those procedures. And the reason why I'm so passionate about this is because successful housing areas are mixed tenure. You read a lot in the paper about um, you know, big sweeping statements, political statements, we need to build more council houses again, we need to build more housing estates. And, and you can really see a scenario where in, in that dynamic where we're building less and less rental products for affordable purposes, the solution is going to end up being, well, we'll just build some big estates and they'll be government owned and government run through local authorities. Most of my career has been spent dealing with the problems of building mono-tenure, predominantly social rented housing areas in the past and they're fake housing markets, they're protected areas because the person that owns them, the registered provider, the local authority can't allow them to fail. So they're topped up and they're protected but they're not sustainable in their own right. So we've really got to get to grips with how do we integrate the full range of affordable products within and alongside market products to make them sustainable and successful market areas. And I think that that for me is about trust and genuine partnership 
um, delivery and long-term management over time. But I think just to jump in on that, one of the challenges we often face is when you're delivering that mix within development, because if you're delivering 5 10% of a 300-unit block mm -hmm. in terms of getting an RP who can manage it, dealing with the management charges, the actual delivery, it, it becomes a real challenge. And I think that there's got to be ways to work through that because communities work better exactly when they're mixed communities. Um, but quite often it, it's the logistics of delivering it means that the affordable is taken off site and delivered elsewhere. Yeah. Which doesn't, doesn't necessarily always work. Absolutely. And I think particularly when you're looking at high density products where the RP might be taking a number of units within a bigger block and then you've got all the challenges of management. But again, what we're doing at Red Bank and, and the conversations we've got with RPs, and obviously Hillary jump in here, but it's about how what's their role in management yeah, working with you. Exactly that. And I think um, we come under a lot of heat sometimes as to why aren't we doing council houses on all of our schemes. And I think our, our view in Victoria North is appropriate affordable homes in appropriate locations. So. Um, you know, when we come forward with each of the delivery plots, we're going to be working with the RPs to work out what is most appropriate in that area. Um, and um, and that's how we've sort of dealt with the first phase of, of Victoria North, where we focused a lot of the social event in the Collyhurst area, where there are families and there are people that, 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 that need that type of housing in that area. And Nicola's right in terms of our, our, the management. So at, at Victoria Riverside, um, Trafford Housing, l and are taking the full tower from us. Um, however, what's important to us and it's important for the rest of the estate is that we still have the ability to manage that area ourselves. So we have a relation, the relationship we have with L&Q and Q and Trafford Housing is that we'll, we will be managing the, the tower, we will be managing that block as part of our estate because it's really precious to us that the, the estate that anybody is living it, whether they're affordable or private or BTR, they're living in an environment that is, you know, well managed well looked after um, but yeah I think I think throwing in you know 10 social rented apartments within a private rented scheme you know will cause no end of issues for us so that's why at the master plan level early on in the process we want to work with the RPs to identify appropriate plots and appropriate locations for different mix of homes. And it goes back to the place shaping thing. You know, Sam using place shaping, I'm learning as well. Uh, but the idea is like you don't want to just plop social homes into you know the rural areas where maybe they can't get access to hospitals or they can't get access to where they need to go to work. So it does sound like it's about making and really focusing on putting in social infrastructure. Would you say that's that's about right, Hillary? Oh yeah, I mean yes. Yeah, you you can't create a community without having access to to, to all the all the um, all the facilities that you that you need to, to live in, in the neighbourhood. And I think you know in Collyhurst, you know, unfortunately over the over the, the the history of the estate where many homes have been demolished, it means that there isn't a critical population there to support social infrastructure um, requirements. So you know they only have one shop, and and you need to you know get a bus to a cash machine, and all of that is you know a huge issue for the, the existing community there and I, and I think when we're, we're when we're master planning and we're looking at Red Bank and then when we look at future phases in Collierst it will be about creating you know sufficient population to support these other uses um, and also being allowing people to travel and and and, and, and access areas, so promoting walking and cycling and also public transport to the areas outside of those neighbourhoods. Um, yeah, but, you know, having, having other uses within the neighbourhood other than residential is, is fundamental to, to a su successful community. And, and we're talking about, when we talk about affordable housing, we're talking about, it's a wide spectrum of people that need to access affordable housing now because affordability of homes has become such a, an apparent issue. But we're still... You know, the large, there is a large cohort within the people that, that need affordable housing that do have genuine um, social mobility issues. So we've got people who can't travel long distances to access service provision because they might not own a car. Um, you know, that idea of locating um, social infrastructure with housing is probably more important when you're delivering meaningful affordable than, than any other um, uh, form of tenure. I think the other thing that we're seeing um, which is, a, a, I guess, a very specific part of the market, but it's the role or the relationship between um, unlocking existing housing stock through older person, um, older people leaving houses and accessing um, new build and the types of community infrastructure they need. And in particular, how that might be driving a shared ownership type product where older people want to release part equity within their stock 
uh, within their home, but still feel it's important that they own something. Um, so this idea of older people moving into a shared ownership space and the types of community infrastructure that they might need, so it's not just schools, it is genuine health provision within, uh, within those local areas is going to be really important. Yeah. Doug, look like you had a thought on that. No, I was going to say that the, the, the whole um, uh, housing, of, you know, in terms of elderly population it, it is a key area of, of, of meeting delivery because there's an affordable need within that, that sector and, and that, that's a challenging one to meet. But also there, there's, there's the freeing up of houses, but also I, I see the meeting that accommodation as a real opportunity in terms of regenerating a lot of town and city centres because... Um, as we, you know, we've just been talking through access to, you know, shops, leisure, theatres, etc., are, are critical, and also higher density development. A lot of more uh, elderly persons accommodation can be high density. They're, they're not wanting, they're not generally necessarily owning cars, wanting large gardens. So it's a real opportunity to integrate that and provide a real mix because I think a lot of town centres have been great at building BTR schemes, getting the, the 20s, 30s in, um, but then there's a bit of a gap, and I think there's been an increasing trend of getting 50 pluses back into city centres and town centres. And I think that there's a really big opportunity around that, and not just on the affordable side, but uh, across the whole market. And I think, um, I, I completely agree with that, and I think the other thing that we have to be mindful of in terms of delivering affordable homes, you know, this, we, we're under so much pressure to deliver more development on brownfield land, uh, protect our green belt, you know, all eyes on, on urban regeneration and housing delivery. Most of our housing development over the last few years, I mean, you just need to, it's, it's so well known in Manchester in terms of the, the, the type of product that's come forward, the explosion of build to rent within the city centre, student living within the city centre, and everything that Hillary said before about the importance of delivering family homes within some of these city fringe and edge of urban locations. Most housing stock that exists currently today in those city fringe locations is legacy affordable homes. Some of it has been brought, uh, been uh, uh, sort of um, shifted in terms of rent to buy, but so much of it, like Collyhurst, is legacy affordable housing areas. So when we talk about this pressure to deliver affordable homes within these locations, there is, of course, pressure to build more affordable homes, but there's huge pressure to deal with existing affordable stock as well, because these areas have to work together as, as real single or connected housing markets. So this idea of bringing older people into urban areas is very important, but also what's the role of existing stock in that and how do we need to invest in it to, to do so? Yeah, and I know when we talk about you know, existing stock, a lot of that is kind of acknowledging as well the need to retrofit Absolutely. and get everything back to a better standard when it comes to carbon emissions. So I know Wales in particular seems to be offering a bit of a carrot and stick when it comes to making affordable housing sustainable. I mean, it's banned fossil fuel heating in new social home schemes starting in October, so that's has help for everyone. And then also, you know, it's also said it's going to commit 250 million pounds to build 20,000 low carbon homes over the next few years. Do you think this is kind of the right approach that the government should be taking? Should it be doing more? Can we learn more from Wales? <laughs> <laughs> so, to me. Um, so I suppose um, when you talk about affordable housing or any type of housing and the green agenda, I suppose what are we talking about there? Are we talking low carbon, carbon neutral? zero carbon in operation, zero carbon um, construction, passive homes. There's such a, a wide range of different uh, types of, 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 of adjustments that you can make into the, the way that we build. I suppose the example in Collyhurst, so that our, our phase one uh, Collyhurst scheme, to make each of those homes um, carbon, uh, zero carbon in operation, it would be an additional £6,000 per unit. So. That obviously has huge viability pressures on us. So at the moment, the Collyhurst scheme is um, uh, carbon neutral. It's quite a leap for us to then make it make it zero carbon in operation. And there's already significant uh, uh, viability challenges in, in Collyhurst, which doesn't really have a, a market for, for private, uh, private resi at the moment. So I suppose... Um, back to probably some of the comments I made earlier about um, government funding to, to support projects. You know, we will be looking to, in the next phases, to access and look for, to grab funding to, to, to support some of the affordable homes and open market homes that we bring forward in Collyhurst to make them zero carbon because, you know, frankly, at the moment, our viability wouldn't, wouldn't support us moving to uh, zero carbon, albeit it's really important to us and, and the, the homes at the moment will be carbon neutral. Um, it's just, it's quite a difficult question when there's such quite a range of, of different um, 
a different you know carbon on the carbon spectrum about but what we're going to target for the homes but as i said in my presentation it's something that, that that's precious for us it's it's the future obviously and and it's something that that we need to develop for um for a 10-year delivery program i think that the affordable sector is is well placed to sort of drive some of those um carbon and because if, if i think back um affordable housing was always to better space standards and market mm -hmm. housing uh, and uh, rps or, or councils or whatever they're long-term investors in properties um it, you know it, it's always a pleasure working with rps on, on planning applications because they want to invest in, in in green infrastructure in open space in the quality of public realm because they're managing and maintaining those properties for the next you know 20 30 50 100 years so they want to invest in it and the attraction is in creating communities and long-term investment whereas you know some of the other developers their business model is around selling and moving on so i think it, it enables um standards to be raised and in the work that we at wsp do with homes england it's about driving the quality and the design agendas to to deliver you know, place making and, and higher quality of places to try and set exemplars for, for other developers to follow so i think that the affordable sector is, is well placed in that respect i think that's right i think that when you look at um even in recent years some of the, the award-winning housing that's been developed nationally in this country a lot of it is affordable housing because they will take risks they'll take design mm. risks but they're able to do it because of the grant regime that supports yeah. what they're delivering um, which you know that's not a criticism but let's take advantage of that let's learn working in partnership with that uh, with that sector I think the other thing on um, carbon efficiency within affordable homes you know we've touched on both new build and retrofit of existing homes and I think both will be a priority for the um, affordable housing sector but there's a really important point about education and I, actually I think this transcends the housing market in general so you know when you put um, sustainable kit on an existing affordable home is the, the the person that lives in that house ought to then be paying less in in um, living costs their, their bills should go down as a result of that what's then going to happen to their rent is 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 the market going to use that as an opportunity to put rents off is that going to start to change what an affordable, affordable rental product looks like for example do people understand that as people who live in these houses how it's going to be advantageous to them um, from a from a bill perspective and I genuinely think that is just an issue within the housing market you know I always joke about uh, my mom uh, talks about whether she should buy an electric car as her next car um, and she, she sees it as a very binary thing will I be able to charge it at a petrol station and she doesn't associate that with well if I also invest in charging kit at home PV panels on my roof battery storage within my house is it a really you know palatable nice version of, of the old storage heaters that actually saved people a lot of money what she hasn't got is the education to understand how valuable that could be for her so there's a real disconnect we talk about it from a kit perspective from an investment perspective but we sometimes miss the education piece of the take up you know at the domestic level of people understanding you know how it could really change their circumstances yeah, that's really interesting, especially I know we're actually doing a COP26 podcast series, which is all about kind of digesting the big movements and how we can be doing actionable change to make developments more sustainable. And that's definitely some of the topics that we've been talking on. We're going to go to questions from the audience. So I hope you guys are on Slido. There's a lot of questions on here. Uh, I'm going to start with Martin Bennett's question, though. Martin, don't know where you are. There you are. Hey, Martin. Uh, his question is, there are four million low quality houses in the UK should the government funding be directed to those houses rather than to new builds? I'll take the question. All right, yeah. <laughs> Good. Um, yeah. No, is the answer no? <laughs> um, so I started my career um, nearly 20 years ago working predominantly um, on uh, delivering uh, change within failing housing markets through the government's housing market renewal pathfinder program. Um, and you know, there's lots of views, I'm sure there'll be lots of views on this room whether that was a good program, bad program. I wrote my dissertation on it. I also have my own views um, on it. But what it was as a program was a long-term sustained commitment to investing in existing housing areas. Where it focused, probably unfortunately, was on the clearance of housing stock as opposed to the investment in existing housing stock. But what it was was a sustained, genuine commitment to delivering change within existing housing areas. That program uh, ended, obviously. Uh, we had political change at the highest level in the government, complete shift in, in how we deal with um, housing investment as a result. 
Since then, there has been no um, consistent investment within existing housing areas. We still work with a lot of registered providers who are grappling with investment in what are effectively failing housing market areas. They're only not failing because they're propped up by that RP, continuing to invest in the stock, continuing to manage the place in the way that they do. Um, and there is honestly no capital program to make meaningful change happen within those locations. That then has been further crippled by what happened at Grenfell and the cladding crisis and the issues of legacy high density housing that's, that's held by a lot of those registered providers. And genuinely sitting with those people, with these master plans, with these great plans, with these long term commitments to these people as opposed to this stock, um, they don't really know where to go because there's no consistent long term capital program. Um, I don't think it's an either or question, but I think we've got to get it right. And for me, definitely, we, when we talk about the housing crisis, we can't just talk about building new houses. We have to do right by the homes that we already have within this country. Um, it's not really an answer as much as something that really gets my go, I suppose. Yeah. All right, we have a question from Bill. It's our top voted question right now, so I'm going to ask it. Uh, as an FYI, you can be upvoting questions, so if you want to make sure that our panel sees it, upvote. So we have a new housing minister in Michael Gove. What is your message to the minister to help promote development? Doug, go. <laughs> <laughs> well, if they, they come with great uh, regularity, don't they, housing ministers? And, and the challenge is that the one who's just left, I think, was the longest serving, and that was less than two years in, re in recent times. And I think the, the, the key point is, is, is from, our, from where I sit in terms of planning reforms, um, each minister comes up with some new reforms. They take a long time to come through. They get watered down. They get changed. And, and then by the time they get around to moving them forward, they're out of a job and a new minister comes in. But I, I think from my point of view, it, it's about taking the current planning reforms that are in place, taking the good parts of them and then driving them forward. And to my mind, the main area around that, I, I don't want to pick out, is just moving local plans forward. Um, it takes years and years, I think on average seven years, to create a local plan and get sites allocated, which is far, far too long. Um, and we need to get the system moved forward and the reforms are seeking a 30-month period to get things brought forward. So whilst I've heard it over the last decades, we'll speed up planning many, many times, I think there has to be a way about getting that aspect of planning moved forward in order to provide some certainty to the market to set aspirations for landowners as to what affordable or other requirements might be and to make sure that we're planning for infrastructure. So that, that would be my first big ask. Yeah, anyone else want to touch on that one? Um, um, uh, so when we meet Michael Gove, <laughs> I'm sure FEC will be, um, to discuss how and what the central government can do to help facilitate, as I've said, one of the biggest regeneration <coughs> projects outside of London, it's going to definitely be around the funding ask. What we're setting out of our aspirations in, in, in Victoria North both speak to Manchester's local policy agenda around zero carbon, affordable, etc., but also the, the national policy agenda around all of those things. And so we, we want to support that and, 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 and answer, you know, and, and develop our schemes in response to the direction that the government is taking our country in and the direction that Manchester is taking the city in. We can't do that without without access to to some of the capital funding programs to support some of these some of these really complex sites. And also, I, I feel you know, and I'm not close to it. Um, the sort of the, the continuous shifting and movement of regulations and policy and the time it takes it makes it difficult for us to to operate and plan a 10 year program when there's so much change and and, insert, and uncertainty. So so I think you know we'll be we'll be selling our scheme. We'll be saying that we're committed to Manchester, which we are through our 100 million plus investment that we've already made in the city. We want to do more. We want to look at other opportunities elsewhere. But, but really, you know, we need support in terms of the funding and we need, you know, the government behind us on what we want to do. And Hilary, I'm going to keep you in the hot okay. seat because Rob Wiggins from Property Hub, don't know where Rob is, uh, but he wants to know during the lifetime of major developments such as Red Bank, we're going to experience a severe downturn in the market. So how will we navigate this? So, Hilary? Oh, yes, very positive question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yeah, I mean, like, that is actually one of, our, one of the risks that we, we, can sit, we continuously review and, and, and is a concern for us. I suppose 
hopefully I've sort of touched on it, but the diversification of the, of the product of the homes that we create is really, really key to if there is a downturn in the market, that we are still going to be needing to provide affordable homes. We are still going to be needing to provide homes for people to live in. So the diversification between high-rise apartments, BTR, affordable, um, low-rise, that is really important for us to, to, to try and mitigate against an uncertain housing market and, and potential downturns. And we also have, you know, we're in it for the long game, FEC. We're, we're um, you know, we've got patient capital. There's a huge amount of infrastructure investment that we need to make beyond Red Bank and Collyhurst in other parts of the Victoria North that will then be able to unlock and facilitate sites in the future. So I suppose the media is our ability to diversify our product and diversify the offer to our customers, but also looking at next phases, future phases beyond Red Bank, future opportunities for infrastructure investment that's probably going to take, you know, several years to secure the funding and then, and then actually unlock these sites. Great. And Katie Saunders wants to know, what is the panel's view on the impact that the new building safety regime will have on the viability of development of both high and low rise housing? Nicola, I know you touched on that a little bit in your answer to the previous question. Would you mind starting us out on that one? Yeah, yeah. Um, I think, um, I think any, look, I think there's a lot of nervousness in the housing market at the moment um, around high rise living. I think that's, that's probably a fair thing. I think the the impact of, um, you know, Grenfell and, and cladding and the fact we still haven't dealt with that, the fact we still don't know how we're going to deal with that in terms of existing housing stock is, is a major issue. Mm -hmm. And I think that confidence trickling through to people who are buying and, and renting property is, is increasingly important, particularly in the, in the um, buying market. So, you know, if, if you were buying a flat in Manchester city centre right now, um, how difficult is it going to be to get a mortgage in the context of the um, of the building uh, standard that, that's been delivered within the building that you're trying to buy in? I think um, in terms of um, new safety regimes, I think uh, the, the question is, are we absolutely confident? The question for me is absolutely confident that, that they are what they need to be. And it's that's the confidence point for me in terms of the actual you know, we can we can build homes, we can we can deliver housing, but who's buying them, who's renting them, who's living in them, and what's their confidence in them going forwards? And I think it's not unlike the, the planning uh, regulation point. We sort of need to get to a position where we have some stability, where we have confidence in the market, and where viability can almost rebase itself, and we can understand what that means. All these things are layering up on top of each other. So you layer that with with the pressure for delivering low carbon within that infrastructure as well. Everything feels like a cost on the system at the moment, rather than something that's going to leverage more value. Um, and, and that's the bit we've got to deal with. Um, how do we make that not just a cost, but by establishing the trust in the market, something that drives value and drives market demand within some of that product as well? Yeah. So Doug, Steve Bell from Turley wants to know how the planning system can, where it fits in the purpose of terms of meeting affordable housing needs. <laughs> well, big question there. The, 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 to my mind, it, it, it should take a leading role in, in planning to meet affordable needs. Uh, the way the planning system approach of working from a bottom up of understanding housing needs assessments, e each area has different needs for different communities. Um, and it's, the planning system has the ability to, to put policies in place to set expectations within the market because a lot of the viability expectations and debates we all have, and I'm sure Steve has on a weekly basis, is around landowner expectations of what their land's worth. Now, when policies are in place and uh, provide clear clarity and guidance, then those expectations are set, and it can perhaps rebalance it more to provision of affordable housing and other infrastructure. So I think the planning system can play a key role in leading, um, setting that certainty. It, it can also... Um, look at, at where affordable housing is, is provided and we, we, we've mentioned it a few times this morning around, around Greenbelt and that's a debate for another day and it, it, you could spend hours on it but where there are sites which are perceived to be easier to develop then there's the ability to set higher levels for affordable delivery so I think it, it's an, there's lots of tools in the planning kit bag which we can use to, to drive affordable housing um, but a lot of it comes down to having it built in and understood through, through a plan process rather than 
fighting it out at application stage through viability reviews and appraisals and appeals where it, it can get confrontational around um, scheme delivery. Um, more about it, it's setting expectations first. I think as well, um, Steve, it, you, know, you, you know this, but it, it's about the RICS guidance and, and how do we model viability as part of the development process. And I think you know, we do a lot of work with RICS on, on writing that guidance and I think they would acknowledge that that needs to evolve, you know, that point about mm who determines what land value is, you know, the, the book says it shouldn't be the landowner, the process says it, it more often than not is. Uh, I think the other thing that it doesn't properly capture is the full definition of value, so there's a lot of pressure on things like social value, carbon infrastructure as part of new homes, it doesn't properly capture that as a value within the process. So I think um, it, it's not just about planning reform and, and, you know, local plan documents and policies. It's actually about in, in practice what guidance exists and how well is that understood by people on both sides of the table to get an honest open book position on what land value actually is and what that means for affordable housing delivery. Yeah, I know one of our most popular stories from last week, one of the ones that got the most reads, was actually by Dan Whelan. He wrote about former Secretary of State Robert Jenrick's virtual appearance at CIH last week. And Jenrick said that a levy instead of the Section 106 agreements would give councils more control over what developers contribute and get rid of some of the viability argument when it comes to affordable housing. Do you guys think that's a good idea? Or is there a better way of getting affordable housing uh, than a levy or Section 106 agreements? If, if I jump in first, I mean, it, it's a debate that successive governments have gone through um, yeah. in terms of land value capture, um, levies, taxation. Um, you can look at it in both sides. The Section 106 approach has its merits insofar as it allows negotiation between the councils and developers and uh, around what, what can be delivered on a scheme. Um, and, and it allows flexibility because what we don't want to get to is where um, le levies or contributions are fixed such that they frustrate development because landowners won't release their land because the returns just aren't there. Uh, on, on the flip side, the Section 106 process is fairly opaque and communities don't really get much chance to engage in it. And as I said at the start, quite often the affordable housing element is squeezed out where you've got SIL and other requirements which can't be moved. Um, affordable housing gets squeezed out. So I think it, there's probably a long way to go on this. It, it could have some merits, um, but there's got to be that level of local control in, in how it's applied and, and, and how those contributions are spent. Quite often, the, the, with, with SIL, the communities who are who are getting the development don't see the be, don't see the benefits of having the development in their area, and I think there's a real challenge around that. I think the um, how it would be spent is probably the key bit. I, I think uh, Mr. Jenrick probably would like local authorities to have more money at their disposal, and therefore a levy is advantageous because it would give them a capital pot to work with. But would that actually result in more affordable homes being built, and would they be? as we spoke about before, would they be as part of sustainable mixed tenure, mixed type developments, or would it be a route to be delivering monotype, monotenure housing areas on, on public land, et cetera, et cetera. I think we've got to be really clear, if there's a levy, how is that going to be spent? Where SIL works really well is where there's good strategy, good projects that everyone buys into and understands why they have to contribute to it, and then it's a case of can development afford to, to pay for it? it would, this would, that would have to be backed up with something really meaningful from a delivery perspective. Just picking up on a, the point uh, that Doug was making around the use of Section 106 and affordable housing, you know, and, 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 and back to what Nicola was saying about involving the RP early on in the process. Obviously, if affordable housing are captured by Section 106, it's not possible for the RPs to access the grant funding from Homes England for those units. And so it's it's thinking about how we, and we, you know, when I was touching on some of the strategies with looking at our affordable housing strategy, how do we engage with an RP, bring them into the, 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 the planning application, which means that we're not hamstrung with the Section 106, which means that the units aren't, you know, we're not able to uh, attract grant for those units because they're already in a legal you know, agreement as part of planning. That's the, the point about bringing in RPs early, engaging with them early in the process it is really important because you know, as soon as, you, as soon as you've committed as a developer to 10% affordable on your site, it, that scuppers the chance for the RP to, to tr attract grant for those units. Okay, one question from Sean. Do you think we can achieve culture change where families do live in higher density developments rather than, to, rather than the traditional suburbia that many in the UK aspire to? Hillary. Well, Sean, we're on that journey, wherever you are. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, I think, like, obviously, in Europe, 
families do live in high density um, locations. And I suppose it's not, the offer from us isn't going to be just come and live in, you know, close to spinning fields and, and, and bring your family up there. It's about that neighbourhood that we're trying to create. It's not just plonking somebody in, in the city centre and, you know, um, you watch out for the buses as, as they're speeding past your door. Um, it's more about you're living in a park, you're living in a, a, in a community that has access to all of the, these things that you need to, to raise your family. And, and I think it isn't just as simple as saying, you know, guys, come and live in these apartments rather than, you know, out in South Manchester. It's more about come and buy into this neighbourhood that we want to create. Um, come and buy into, you know, being five minutes walk to everything that you need, 15 minutes walk to, to, to the wider neighbourhood. It's completely changing the perception of, of how traditionally we've, we've, we've lived in the UK. And, and I think probably the pandemic has changed how people think about living and, and how people think about their local neighbourhoods. Because throughout the pandemic, when I would come into the city, it was dead, the, the cities. But then when I when I went out at home, like when I, where I live in South Manchester, the, the streets and the neighbourhoods were really, you know, much busier than they would normally be on a, on a, on a Wednesday lunchtime. And I suppose it's just that, that mindset set of, of thinking, I'm going to live in a, in, in a community which is high rise, high density by the city, but, but really, you know, uh, everything I need is right there, you know, for me. And I, I want to change my perception about what, what it means to live in family homes. It's not going to be easy, and I hope I did set it out that these are all sort of exciting challengings rather than FEC has the answer to it. But we definitely think there's a, there needs to be a shift towards living in a more sustainable community like that, be it you a one-person household or, or, or a family of, of five. We, we need to remember as well, like, we talk about this like it's never, ever been done before, and we're just little old UK and we don't know how to do it, and... And as if it's this exciting continental Europe experience of living and, and family, uh, family lifestyle. You know, go to Edinburgh. <laughs> On the edge and part of Edinburgh city centre is vast amounts of former tenement stock. That's some of the most expensive housing stock within, within this country. You know, we're talking about delivering um, a really vibrant family offer on the edge of one of the biggest, most exciting cities in this country like that. That is exciting. Of course, it's a challenge. It's really exciting. Think about the lives that those those children and young people are going to have growing up, and the experiences they're going to have doing so. Like, it's not easy, and we have to be really precious about how we deliver open space and community provision, and make sure that enough of that is private and it's safe and it's enjoyable. But what what great environments we can create as a result of it? So I think we've got to go into it like passionately and positively. It has got the job on the marketing team. team. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, 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 yeah, I agree fully. It, it definitely does work. I mean, you've got to look at Vimto Gardens and places like that, which are absolutely perfect examples of where you, you can integrate family housing. I think one of the challenges comes around land values, and, and the closer you get to city centre, the higher the land values, the greater the need to build higher and higher in order to, to, to make developments work and release sites. And I think until we can sort of get a handle around, uh, as Hillary said, master planning areas and actually designating areas for lower density, and it doesn't have to be suburban low density. It can be it can be a, a higher density, but but more suited to to, to townhouses or muse houses rather than apartments. Um, when we can build that in and plan for it, it gives us the opportunity to delivering it because we're able to build those communities. Um, so, but it, it definitely can work and it is working. And I think as we get more schools, more infrastructure, it will it, the perceptions will change. I mean, w w when I started working 20, 25, 26 years ago, the, the city centre, you came into work and you went home. Mm -hmm. But it has changed now because the residential population has hugely increased. Um, it's now a case of diversifying that population. And I think great strides are being made. And I think if you come back in 10 years' time, there'll be lots more really good examples. And that actually turned out to be the last question. So we, uh, Peter, I think you're going to have to find Hillary later to get your answer about BTR and FEC. Thank you guys so much for joining our panel today. Can you get a round of applause for <laughs> Doug, Hillary, and Nicola? All right. Thank you guys so much. That was awesome. Uh, now we have a little break. You can get some coffee, do some networking, stretch your legs. I'll see you back here at 10.50 for the next panel where we're talking about the future of the sector. Thanks so much. And welcome back. Everyone caffeinated, feeling good about that? I have been instructed that the breakfast was not awesome. It was Kraken. 
So now I'm all Northwest good. Uh, so next up, we're going to have a presentation from Tracy Gordon, the lead officer for housing partnerships with Liverpool City Region Combined Authority. They have made a housing a priority in its most recent plan, announcing the, I'm sorry, it's announcing its goal to help create 2,400 new homes in the region. Tracy, I'm leaving this whole crowd into your very capable hands. So if I can get a round of applause for Tracy. Gosh, good morning. It's a, a little bit scary to see people in person. Um, and instead of staring at little squares uh, in, in, a, in a computer screen. So it's lovely to be here and it's lovely to be in Manchester talking about Liverpool City Region. So um, Liverpool City Region Combined Authority is much newer than uh, the, our Greater Manchester colleagues. So it's just been four years since our Mayor um, Steve Rotherham was elected and set up the organisation. And we've been pretty housing light in our devolution deal. Um, so uh, one of the areas that we do have, though, is a, a spatial development strategy. So we're very much looking at the policy context for the city region from a housing and a development perspective. Um, it's not until 2023 that it's going to be formally adopted, but we have done early engagement with um, our local stakeholders, which includes you know, uh, a, a really wide range of people because we want to make sure we're getting everybody in the city region to contribute to that. So these are just some of the things that have turned out to be important to our clients and, and our customers that, that they have said so far. And the top one, interestingly, from this morning's debate is actually climate change. And so in our SDS, we will be talking about standards um, don't know how well you're seeing these pictures. Um, and I didn't want to put a picture of houses because I know housing standards is, is a great debate at the moment. Um, but I'm also in charge of um, housing retrofit at the city region. And at the moment, every time I see a new development with a beautiful gas boiler in it, I actually feel quite depressed because I think we're probably gonna have to take that out um, in the next 10 years. Um, and when I say we, we're going to have to have a strategy for um, particularly the open market, the able to pay market, to convince people to change um, that, that situation. So when I'm talking about standards, we will be looking at uh, space standards, which I know are controversial. Um, not just the energy standards, but accessibility. We've already mentioned um, you know, an ageing population, and certainly we have a, a population with health, a lot of health issues. Um, so accessibility for all. Um, and we're still having that debate at the moment and we'd, we'd love you to, to become involved and say what you think about the different standards um, as well as the standards that are being driven at the moment from central government on policy. So what we started doing um, is we know what we want and I'm glad I put this slide in because this is you know, larger executive houses um, in, in a beautiful setting with the lovely Suds Pond at the front. Um, we've actually done some research in Liverpool City Region and had an interesting debate last year about what we want. And so we realised that um, a lot of our higher earners are actually not living within the city region. They're going to, I'm not going to name any of the other places because they should be living in the city region. And so what we want to do is we want to work with our planners and our developers to make sure that we're attracting people who are high economic earners to improve the economy of our city region. And that's not to say that we don't want the mixed communities and uh, work with our housing association partners to deliver affordable and have those mixed, vibrant, sustainable communities but we know what we need, and at the moment, they're not being delivered in the right places and to the right quantum, and we want to work to make sure that they are. I was glad that somebody talked about older people's housing, because the other thing that we're not getting is the right level of older people's housing. And I think COVID has been a great time to start the debate about that. And we're talking about reframing how we speak about it um, as someone approaching needing to downsize. <laughs> um, I would love to move into something like this, which isn't in the city region, but it's a, a first co-housing um, award-winning scheme. Um, and we want to empower people 
about how they could deliver the housing that they need together with maybe contractors rather than developers um, and look at, dare I say the words, custom build, self build again, which I believe government, although who knows what government will do next. Uh, I believe government are talking about that again and again you, looking more at the European model and how we can promote that kind of um, self build, custom build, um, you know, uh, brand again and coming from somebody whose father's self-built three times including finishing his last one when he was 75 really really keen on it <laughs> um, but we do want to look at a rental market too and um, this is a, a, an image from Liverpool Waters with a beautiful third grace um, in the background the liver birds you can just about see in this image um, we have an amazing waterfront and an amazing city um, and we are looking to work with um, external partners to bring in institutional investors in particular um, to build the right quality of rental product. We've had um, interesting discussions with government at uh, uh, Liverpool City Council level as well as the Liverpool City Region level about having the right um, powers to um, look at how to control rental and particularly, you know, poor um, poor uh, managers of their rental property and, and do some more enforcement. Because the debate this morning about the housing market renewal, and it's amazing to see that people are still speaking about housing market renewal, we do still have areas where housing market renewal was stopped. A lot of development stopped then, and there's areas that are left over and, and need to be considered. Um, but we do want those kind of opportunities for proper rental products where they're well managed, they're well considered, and they're really, really popular to attract a, a mix of people into the city region. So what everybody always asks when, when we come is, do you have funds? And the answer is, yes, we do. Um, so we were delighted that um, there's more devolution of funding and we're consider continuing to lobby government about what leveling up means. Um, and what um, uh, what more f more funds and opportunities and powers can be devolved to the city region, and we work across the northwest and indeed across all the the metro mayors and the devolved uh, agencies to to lobby government for more decisions to be taken locally. We know the local market, we know the local sites, we know the local players. We want to make sure we're giving them the right support because we need to collaborate to deliver the right things. So we did get 45 million of Brownfield land funds um, last year. Um, it was challenging. We got told in July that we had uh, nine months to spend nine million pounds uh, on housing uh, with no warning of the scheme coming. So um, it's been really, really challenging, but it has been oversubscribed. Um, we did meet our first year challenge. We're now trying to meet our second year challenge. Um, but we will have allocated all of that funding, so please do not ask me for any today because I don't have any left, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, but we do also have devolved funding, and we have also used that to look at some of the intractable brownfield land sites that we've had in the city region. So this is an image of the Garden Festival site, as you all probably heard about in Liverpool City region again. Beautiful riverside views in an amazing area. Uh, will be right on the doorstep of, of green infrastructure that's been retained from the Garden Festival, who I don't know if anybody would even remember the Garden Festival. Uh, look. Oh, yeah, a few nods. We won't, we won't single you out and say who you are. Um, but we've invested um, 26 million in here with another 10 million from Homes England, working with Liverpool City Council to actually get away the first 50, uh, 1,500 unit scheme. Um, and whilst um, Hillary's gone, the talk this morning about Red Bank was like on a smaller scale. So we have at the Combined Authority uh, a lot of different collaborations that we're looking at. So we've worked with um, the energy provision to get some of their green infrastructure fund to get the electricity provision on site. And we've got the electricity provision on site because we want this either to have a heat network or be pure electricity so that we are looking at our zero carbon standards uh, going forward. 
And then, um, I'm being very quick maybe, but leaving us more time to have that discussion. Um, we did want to talk about the COVID impacts. So um, this is my local park where there's been some beautiful wildflower planting, um, but there is a medium rise um, block of flats in the background. Um, we've been doing some research on, on what the impact of COVID has been and what will it mean to the industry. And I think it's really a, a bit early to say what the long lasting impacts of that have been. Um, however, we have seen that the Wirral um, and the, the edges of the city region have been really, really popular and people have been moving there um, during COVID. And we've been looking at some of our town centre funds to make sure that that five minute living, 15 minute city is realistic for people to go there. But we also want to look at making sure there's sustainability and from a sustainability perspective and an active travel perspective, we do want to keep people in our city centre and in our towns and keep a mix of those. So we'll need to look at green infrastructure in particular, which has proved very, very important and particularly in those high density ones. But what hasn't been mentioned yet this morning is we're also looking at what do people want? So everybody's moved into this I don't know, is it lovely? I, I have a personal opinion on it, um, <laughs> which I'll maybe share later. Um, you know, you're living kitchen dining and you're all on top of one another. As you can see, I'm not a fan. Um, and how has that actually been for people in lockdown? And some of our housing associations together with us have been looking at research on how that's been for people. So trying, you know, one or two adults trying to work, trying to homeschool your children, you're all in the same space, you're all in the same rooms. It hasn't been a great experience for people. Um, will there therefore be a move away to separate functioning rooms and will there need to be, I think there'll definitely need to be more areas where you are working uh, and you have a specific work environment in that home for more than one person. Um, and so looking at the functionality of rooms and the different rooms, it has been amazing to see how everybody's decorated their bedrooms um, during lockdown, uh, even to the point where I was interviewing somebody as he was sitting on his bed um, for, for a job. I think we've all found COVID very, very challenging and it'll be really fascinating to see the long lasting impacts of that. Um, and what I just wanted to end on, and I've forgotten to put my slide in, um, is that you know this is all a collaboration. The combined authorities have soft powers. We have some, some strict powers. We have some funding. We always want to make sure you use it. But we also have power together um, and influence, well, well a, a direction into government and, and influencing that policy. And we all need to work together to make sure that we are delivering the right housing for each area in the right manner and particularly uh, tackling some of the difficult um, problems we have. So in the city region, the Liverpool city region, we are looking for a fair, inclusive and healthy society and we need everybody to be working towards the same goals. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Tracy. That was great. Uh, can I have the rest of the panelists go ahead and take their seats? So Tracy, you can just go straight on up uh, to the table. That was really interesting to find out what the Liverpool City Region Combined Authority is up to. And I'm sure there are plenty of people in this room who will be looking to collaborate with you further. Joining Tracy on the panel today, we've got Shannon Conway, who's the Residential Director for Glenbrook. We also have Dan Butler who's a partner with law firm Trowers and Hamlins, Kara McLaughlin, who is a senior director at CBRE and leads their residential land and development team in the north, and Colin Shenton, who's the chief executive of Abedin Life, which is one of the leaders in co-living developments in the northwest. So, Tracy, you kind of stole my thunder a little bit, but my first question is, again, one of those giant big ones. How has COVID impacted the residential market? But actually, Dan, I'm going to have you start us off. Okay, thank you, Chris. I just put on here and everything. Yeah, course, less but... water. <laughs> Answer questions. Um, I think from, from my perspective, given my background isn't property, it's insolvency uh, and insolvency litigation. And so what we've seen, there's been a huge amount of government support. Obviously, you've got the moratoriums on winding up petitions or commercial tenants taking enforcement action. And then you've also got the, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the other 
um, support such as furlough, business rate relief, etc. Now that's all well and good, but actually it's got to come to an end at some stage. And so you've got £7 billion of deferred rent, you've got £70 billion of um, VAT uh, deferrals, tax deferrals generally, and you've got all the, <coughs> the money lent and borrowed from the actual government loan schemes. So the concern for me is it's now tapering off and furloughs coming to an end at the end of this month. The businesses are under pressure. Costs are going up. I think Karen and I were having a quick chat about that at the, um, at the break. So you've got this kind of perfect storm where there's a huge amount of debt on the balance sheet for these businesses. There's no obvious way of repaying it. And you've got costs going up, inflationary type pressures as well. So I think that is a concern, a, a general overview, a concern actually in terms of the impact of, of COVID. Uh, and I think it inevitably will lead to a, a changing environment in terms of bricks and mortar, because just without being the harbinger of doom, it, kind of, <laughs> it, 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 it is the, uh, the world I live in. Um, but I, I suppose the other thing is uh, CVAs and um, restructuring lease obligations. And the reason I'm mentioning that is because there's been a space of these types of um, restructurings over the last year and during the pandemic. And basically what that has led to is a new restructuring environment whereby large tenants, chain stores, etc., with massive portfolios have been able to restructure their lease liabilities. And I think that's really important in terms of resi because you've got different categories of landlords, A, B and C, etc. And the C landlords are really prejudiced by these arrangements. It's the law, it is what it is. Um, but they're basically having rent arrears written off. And I think that will lead to a massive amount of void space or potentially more space, which I suppose on the flip side of that is an opportunity for, for developers, entrepreneurs, authorities, etc. Um, so yeah, on that rather kind of challenging beginning, that, that, that would be my comments on that. Yeah, but this sounds like there's a lot of opportunity there too. You know, where someone's failing, it's your chance to succeed. Well, exactly. Yeah, and I know we've been seeing that a lot as well with people making changes from office complexes, turning them into resi, and I'm sure we're going to start seeing more of that with retail turning into resi as is. Um, but we did touch on this as well with COVID impact and how people, you know, live kind of on top of each other and how was that during the whole pandemic? So, Colin, you've got co-living. How did that survive, you know, isolation? Oh, guess what? I think co-living is totally the answer to any future pandemic. Shocking. <laughs> yeah, why, why, why would I think that? Um, I think other than having just listened to that, I probably want to go home and slip my wrists for five minutes. Um, <laughs> Sorry, Colin. No, 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 you warned me in the break that that's what you were going to say. Um, that, that there's sort of two parts to the answer. One is there's commercial, the other is there's residential. I think what's happened in the pandemic is not necessarily economically structural. I think it's hastened things that were coming anyway. Yeah. Um, and whether that's good or bad probably depends on your individual view. There will always be winners and losers in any exceptional event like COVID. No, nobody wants it to happen again. So although there may be voids in the retailers, there may be other businesses which will come in and take advantage of that. So that's com commercial. I don't think it's a structural problem. We'll recover from it. In terms of residential, it's also been mixed. I'm quite sure if you're, if you're a couple with two kids in a two-bedroom apartment in a you know, city centre and both of you are trying to work from home and doing Zoom calls at the same time and so on, then it, it then becomes difficult. If you're a single older person in a big rambling country house, you probably barely notice it even happened. So the, one, one of the reasons why um, we feel optimistic, just to balance out, um, the other view, um, is that so much of this answer to how you sort of make the residential market respond to things like COVID, and as much as we don't want it to happen again, I guess we're all aware of the fact that it's possible that it might, is that the nature of the architecture and also the nature of what the planning system allows us to produce will directly impact how you solve these problems. So the reason I sort of half jokingly, but actually also half seriously, suggests that something like co-living, which is very new, is, that is part of the solution, is in our particular case, we, we produce buildings where the co-living 
element is subdivided. So if we were to do a building of, we're bringing forward a scheme in Sheffield, which is a 45-story tower. And the deal will be that on each one of those stories is a self-contained Opperdon co-living space. So on each floor will be a small number of apartments, around a dozen, plus some uh, social spaces. And about a third of the floor area of the whole building is given over to social spaces. And the reason that approach was successful during the lockdown was that each floor became its own bubble. So we might have had a dozen people, each with their own private apartment and their own kitchen and their own bathroom, and they can isolate if they wanted to. But on their floor were three or four separate social spaces, partly going to what Tracy was saying about if you're all in one room, what does that mean? You want to subdivide the spaces. Well, in our plans, exactly that's what you can do. Um, so the more choice we have, the more people can be in the right place for them at the right time, and whether that's city, suburban, rural, co-living, BTR, private, owned, rented, whatever. Um, and we're starting to get that. Um, in fact, Red Bank's probably a good example of a large scheme which is trying very hard to be as diverse and variable as, as possible in its offer. Yeah. Shannon, do you have any thoughts on how you know, COVID's impacted how you guys are designing your, your BTR schemes or other schemes? Um, I think just echoing what people on the panel are saying, I think one thing that COVID did, it showed the resilience of BTR, so having those communities and having people connect with one another, and that was between different developments if they were managed by the same managing agent, so all sort of a lot of hours, and they could have Zoom sessions with people in a Newcastle development, in Manchester development, they had sort of dog dressing up competitions and something wooden spoon decorating and all these different things. I still don't know what that is. Um, but they had people connecting in that way. In fact, for the second lockdown, when they could sort of work their way around the regulations, they were opening up certain parts of the building for people to go and work. Empty apartments they were utilising and offering people a separate place to go and work just so they get a break from their own environment. But I'd say one of the biggest things that COVID taught us, which we all should have been doing anyway and we've been saying over and over again is that everybody's different and I think looking into everybody's build their bedrooms or home offices and seeing children jumping in the background or people living on their own it, it made us realize that we're all different um, and I think that's something that needs to come through in development so if I look at our most recent scheme Vox the three bedroom apartments have been really popular with sharers who were living on their own in COVID and want to live with other people. And the one bedroom apartments are really popular with people who are sharing during COVID and are sick of sharing and now want to live on their own. So you can't just pigeonhole everybody into the same box. So one thing we've always tried to do, and this is a BTR design, it, it's, it's inherent in all BTR design if it's done well, is to have a variety of unit choice. Um, and that's an economic um, sort of business commercial decision as well because it just helps with retention within your block and it and the variety of people who are living there which is what you want those mixed communities that we've been talking about all this morning um, and you want to cater to as many different needs and tastes as you possibly can and you want a mixed community of all ages as well in your development so I'll refer to Vox because that's our most recent one the, the age range now is 8 to 69 um, it's a high density built to rent scheme just on Cornbrook tram stop. So does that, the design, I don't think it's changed particularly. We're all about using the areas as much as we can, making sure every area can be used 24 hours a day, whether so we've got a yoga and spa room during the day, but curtains are pulled back during the evening. It can be used as event space or a cinema. So it's, 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 that's really um, making your space work and making your tenants feel like they are getting value for money at every single part of the building. Um, balconies is something that at Glenbrook we've always tried to um, put on all our buildings and as well as the balconies we do have outside space. I know it's been in the press an awful lot about our rooftop running track and bees and gardens at the top of Vox. There's that space for people to be but 50% of that, balcony, uh, that development is balconies. Um, at the beginning of COVID, we were looking at, do we put 100%? And then we looked at the cost of it and said, okay, well, we won't be buying any land because we'll be priced out on everything. But it's looking to incorporate as much green space for people to enjoy as possible. But certainly, we wouldn't look to be doing developments now without any balconies at all. We can certainly put a, a value on them. 
Um, but generally, um, you know, the BTR sector is every development in the city centre is, is full, um, or at the capacity you want it to be 97% because you need churn. Um, it's a really proven sector, um, and that's for apartments whether they have balconies, balconies or not. I'm glad you mentioned balconies because we have a commenter called Balcony Watch on Place Northwest. I don't know if anyone's seen their comments around, but on any scheme that goes up, if there's not a balcony, they're like the first comment in there. They're like, where's a balcony? So uh, it's good to hear that you think that they're still worth putting in, they add value. Oh, um, definitely. And it's about choice. It, it, it's all about choice, some with, some without. And that's it. It's, it's moving away from this homogenous product. Yeah. Kieran, where do you think the market's changed in terms of COVID? I think from a um, regional market's perspective, it's been really interesting to see the redistribution and rippling away of um, demand from urban centres, um, the movement out from London. I think it's really been hollowed out, but it's where that capital has moved to. You know, well documented that seaside towns have absolutely flown. Um, we've seen demand even move out from Manchester city centre towards the suburbs because they, they fancy that you know, t more town centre access to green space and, and that living environment. Even quieter Cheshire market towns, um, Delamere, Colchester, Davenham, places that have really started to fly, and, and, and that's even without um, Rishi Sunak and uh, you know, the stamp duty incentive. You know, people have really made different lifestyle choices because, and, and it's all boils down to commuting and change of working habits. You know, it's much easier now to justify a three-day working week and two days where you don't have to endure that heavy commute, and maybe even within that three-day working week, one day is setting off at half five in the morning and leave at half three. So people are really focusing about their own domestic arrangements and how they live. Before we move on to our slightly next topic, uh, I forgot to plug Slido. So just a reminder, you can be submitting questions to our panelists on Slido. The code is PNWRESI. You can find that on the Place Northwest app or on sli.do. I will be getting to questions sooner than last panel, so get them in, upvote the ones you like. We'll be talking about those soon. Um, Shannon, I know one of your passions is senior living and uh, for the population of people, I'm sorry, we have an aging population and I keep seeing developments pop up for people who are 55 and older. I'm not sure we should be calling that senior at all, but so it is. Uh, do you think that there needs to be a different way we're designing these schemes to kind of address the aging population? It's, it's a really big question um, and the reason we, that it is something that I'm very passionate about. So I sit on GMCA Aging Hub as a sort of commercial partner, sort of advising them on, I suppose, the challenges and the commercial challenges of delivering homes in later life throughout, throughout um, Manchester. One of the things I always start with and say is, is about mid to later life. So we develop homes, or we've traditionally developed homes for first-time buyers, young professionals, families, big gap, retirement living. And the truth of it is you go into retirement living when you, you need to. There's been research, there's a brilliant piece by the Manchester School of Architecture called Right Sizing. I advise anyone to read it because it just nails everything. Um, it says so you only move it when you absolutely have to. So it's 75 age in the, um, in the social housing sector, 85 in the private sector. So you've got this space between, let's say, your empty nesters, and let's say at the moment that would be about 50. My husband's only 50 and we've got a four-year-old, so that is obviously changing as people are having kids later. But at the moment, that's sort of mid-50s, up to the age of 85, where there's nothing really for you. So people, there's, there's a study of the over 50s, 51% don't think their house meets their needs or they could you know move into a different house but only 3.4 percent of over 50s move a year and it's because there isn't the right product so what's the right product well it's what we all want you don't suddenly change or morph into somebody else when you're 50 <laughs> you know it's it, it, it's it's not as clear cut as that you want somewhere which is in a great location close to amenities we talk about the five minute community 50 minute city yep Tick. You want nice, uh, good-sized property, good-sized home. You want a balcony. Um, you want all of those things. Somewhere you can age in place. Somewhere you can entertain people. Um, but you may want a big three-bed detached house in the country. You may want a big one-bed loft-style apartment in the city centre. You suddenly don't become one type of person because you're over the age of 50. So it's a bringing choice for that age group. 
So, and the difference is, what we're doing is we're creating these small, efficient units all the time because it's a tried and tested model. Well, people who are um, in mid to later life don't want those small, efficient units. They're more likely to want the big ones because they can afford it. So we're developing for people who are on a strict budget and borrowing from their parents when there's this huge opportunity of people who actually do have the disposable income to spend on this product. But what's holding it back is, is, is risk. If you've got a tried and tested model of, of building for young professionals and first time buyers or building for families and it's going well, we're in a housing boom, why change that? Why add a, another layer of risk to a model that's working well? And I think BTR is a really good sort of um, test of that. So what we can do in BTR is we can deliver those larger units. We can think more about that and just put a pepper pot it within a development and we are seeing people who are right sizing, I'm going to say, get rid of the word downsizing, because it's all about picking the right sized um, property for you. But we're seeing them move into those BTR schemes because they're well managed and they're in a good location and you get a security of tenure. And we need to move that now into the BTS model. Um, some developers are doing it on small scale sites, but we want to do it on large scale. And the only way you can do it, and I am modelling one at the moment, but it's with a landowner and it's with support, government support, to actually do that and prove that model. And once you've got a model and you've got a track record, you're decreasing risk and you can lead the way for other developers to explore that model further. I could go on and on, but I'm conscious. <laughs> I feel like I've just spoken for quite no, a long I was, time. <laughs> I was enjoying watching everyone like nod along and like, Tracy, you seem to, you know, do you have anything you'd like to add to that? You know, I, I think it is that innovation and certainly we uh, looked in the brownfield land and, and actually mentioned that we'd like, you know, different models for older people. And I am one of those older people and I am thinking of getting rid of my beautiful Victorian house where my children eventually leave very, very soon, I hope. But they can't afford to leave, even, you know, I shouldn't say that, even in Liverpool, you know, it's quite difficult when you're on minimum wage. Um, to find, well, why would you move out of your lovely family home, you know, is part of the reason I'm not making them unco uncomfortable enough. But it's difficult for young people to move out and have any certainty, and certainly, you know, that yo-yo that you, you returning thing is what I'm experiencing with my older one. Um, but in looking round and starting to look round because I know I want to move, there isn't anything I want to move to because uh, space is an issue if you're moving from a Victorian house with beautiful large, open, airy rooms, my furniture won't fit mm -hmm. into a new mm -hmm. apartment. And, you know, we are thinking apartment because I think it is nice to have, not to have to do the garden and, you know, have that tie every weekend and that, that thing. There isn't enough, you know, about that mid-range, exactly as you're saying. And so we would like to see some different things and we are going to try and use our grant funding um, uh, and work with Homes England as well on the next hopeful uh, housing infrastructure fund to to test these properties and to look at the examples um, and certainly in aspirational uh, ambitious projects like the left bank we're looking at that higher density housing um, but aiming it for that older age group because the demographics it is just going to suddenly explode and certainly where we've been seeing people ad adapting that model, they've been surprised at how well they have sold and how popular they have been. Um, so when I used to work at Homes England, you know, we had a tiny little development, 23, and we decided to do, you know, it was the edge of a, a minor town, um, but we decided to do 23 bungalows, you know, make that decision to do that. And that was the highest land value for that piece of land because we specified that and took that risk and said we'd do that. And I think more people need to accept that and we need more policies in place to, to drive that change that needs to happen that the market at the moment isn't delivering enough of. Yeah. Can I just um, make a comment on <laughs> Liverpool? The, I mean, this is before the cladding crisis and catastrophe, um, which is going on at the moment, but pre that when the sales market was was sort of moving along, ticking along nicely in Liverpool city centre, well over 60% of owner-occupiers buying 
we're over the age of 55. Yeah. It's an amazing city yeah. for older people <laughs> to live in because everything, I'd say older, I'm talking mid to later life. Yeah, I'm you not can, offended. You can see yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think, I always say, I try now to always say mid to later life because yeah. that's the gap, there's a gap we're not addressing is this mid, mid, yes. sort of, I hate the word midlife as well because I'm, I'm going to, I, I think I am that and then I'm not I'm saying I'm not but I think I am anyway um, yeah this mid to later life Liverpool City Centre has got it all you know and thank you very much it's, it does. it's, it's, it's well over 60 percent of owner occupiers yes. who are buying in Liverpool City Centre of, yeah. of, of, in that mid to later yeah. life and I think unfortunately a lot of them were the so-called silver splitters mm -hmm. um, but um, yeah we do yeah, that, those amenities and, and all those those activities that you can do with the museums mm -hmm. and the restaurants mm -hmm. and the, you know the the outdoor space. That's exactly what people want. And yeah. yeah. I mean, I, I think we're all sitting here happily agreeing with each other, um, but 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 delivery is a is a problem, yeah. um, and we find resistance from planning authorities if we want to propose larger units. So we brought something forward in Manchester City Centre on. Um, near Portland Street recently. It was a 50-unit scheme. And I wanted to include six four-bedroom apartments, mm -hmm. not necessarily because we were expecting a couple and three kids, mm -hmm. but we might expect an older couple who've got kids who might want to come and visit, or somebody might want to use one as a study, or whatever it is. And my God, if you say anything more than three bedrooms to Manchester City Council, they look at you as if you say, why would you not have a whole bunch of sharers in a four-bedroom flat? Well, the country is full of four-bedroom houses, um, and four-bedroom houses take a bit of managing. And if you're in, you know, mid-life, like eventually you will be, um, <laughs> yeah. you know, you might want to swap your four-bed house yeah. for a four-bed flat, mm -hmm. a lock-it-and-leave-it kind of arrangement, and, you know, as we say, walk to the shops and the gyms and the theatres. But there is absolutely a, a sort of cynicism or a dubiousness about some of the planning authorities who say, well, why would you want a four- or five-bedroom apartment? London's full of them. Mm -hmm. um, you know, why can't Manchester and Edinburgh and Liverpool be, you know, adequately supplied with four or five bedroom apartments too? I don't know thousands of them, but, but there is definitely a demand. And if we want to fragment and offer variation, then we should allow a sprinkling of these things. Do you think that's because, by the way, I fully support the co-living um, right option. So. Um, if it's very well managed, and I know you guys do that, yeah, yeah. Um, if it's very well managed and um, delivered yeah. very professionally, yeah, I think there's a, 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 a place in the market for it. I think it's got an important place. But I know there's a lot of reticence, isn't there, with planning authorities with the co-living product. Do you think it was because you're a co-living provider that they had that reticence? Um, it wasn't a co-living scheme, um, but, but co-living is, is new and exciting and it gets lots of chat. And so most of what we do is, is standard um, BTR or BTS stuff, mm -hmm. and co-living is being added on to our list of activities. Um, but we may have a situation with Manchester where anything that we bring forward, they think, oh, this is co-living by the back door, or it's PBSA mm -hmm. by the back door, or whatever it is. Or actually, no, it's quite the opposite of that. Some of it actually is a reaction to the pandemic, where people will continue to want to work from home permanently or one or two days a week. Um, but they would also like to still do that not in a suburb, but in a city centre. Mm -hmm. So it would be quite nice, actually, to be able to walk, work from home, but still go to Pret and still go to Costa, still pop out for a meeting mm -hmm. and come home again. Um, but you need your apartment, because it will always be an apartment pretty much, um, to function. Um, and that probably means a dedicated room, which is an office. Um, if there's two of you working, maybe, maybe you've got a four-bedroom flat, one's a bedroom, one's a spare bedroom, two of them are studies. But frankly, who, who are we and who are the planners to tell people how to use their apartments? Mm -hmm. if, if they want to build a train set in one of them, do that. You know, it's your space. Um, so the idea that the, that the planning system is sort of deciding what's appropriate um, is, you know, I'm not saying it's anti-libertarian, but I just think you should be able, as a private developer, to build something. You take the risk with your money about whether mm -hmm. you'll sell it or not. If you sell it, you sell it to somebody who obviously wants to buy it. It's meeting a need. Mm -hmm. And all successful businesses are successful because they meet a need. And if we build a four-bedroom flat and we sell it to somebody who's right-sizing, downsizing, doing whatever it is, um, they should have that choice. Mm -hmm. I don't mean build thousands of them. Um, 
because most people who want four bedrooms maybe do want a house. But there'll be a number of people, especially in you know, Manchester, the third most exciting city on the planet, um, we, we should be offering that. So looking at that, I do want to go to Slido right now because we have a question from the last panel that I actually think is actually pretty timely with this one as well. Thinking about how we are right now with the market, we have a bit of a housing boom, but do we think that it's going to burst anytime soon? That's from Anonymous, so a crowd of, shroud of secrecy around them. Karen, why don't you uh, take that one, if you don't mind? Yeah, I'll, I'll be quite quick in this one. Um, housing forecast for the next three to five years is predicated on three things. No base rates in the uh, interest rate, and that looks as if it's set to stay. Um, employment and unemployment. And you can see what's happening in the market right now. As long as we have those three things aligned, I don't see any upset to the um, housing market. Um, moreover, in terms of supply in the northwest, we, we just really are not meet, uh, meeting supply at the basic level. So, in terms of a, a house price um, downturn, I, I just don't see it in the cards in any shape or form. All right, boom! That was quick, simple, and to the point. I liked it. Uh, I'm going to go, <laughs> Tracy. This one's for you. It's from Kevin Whitmore. Hey, Kevin. Uh, how will LCRCA encourage more executive family homes with individual councils such as Whirl as, that are unwilling to consider limited green belt release to provide it? Oh, thank you very much for that question. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're a favorite person now. <laughs> um, I think we are working closely with, with Wirral and you know they do have some very exciting plans particularly around the the Wirral waters area and and working with you know an, an accomplished um, developer and landowner like Peel um, and they do see and we uh, are supporting them that high density family housing is successful um, we're supporting them in looking at different designs and different exemplars from within this country and abroad to look at that concept. And people want to move to the Wirral uh, because it has that beautiful green infrastructure that a lot of it is protected. Um, so by releasing Greenbelt, you know, you would start to take away and eat, eat at, at that you know, at that green infrastructure that we need to keep in place. And we've also got to remember that um, we want to be net zero carbon by 2040, 10 years ahead of the, the government's um, current target. And actually, the only way of reaching that is by offsetting. So we need to look at, you know, what is a very, very limited resource, and particularly on the Wirral, you know, it's a peninsula, it's, it's very constrained. You cannot, well, you can make more land by infilling and, and all that kind of stuff, but you'd have to go you know, into the sea or the river, and we're not going to do that. So land, I think we've got to appreciate, is a limited resource, and we've got to look very, very carefully at what we're doing with it. And Wirral have made that decision that they do want to do brownfield first, and I think the majority of people in this room would agree that brownfield first is the way ahead. Now, it is more complicated, it is more expensive, and we are working um, with, with Homes England uh, and with Wirral Council uh, and the Combined Authority to look at solutions for bringing in money, much like the Red Bank scheme needed this morning. You know, it will need a lot of infrastructure. But the current first phase of Wirral Waters, which Urban Splash is delivering, which uh, you know includes some really nice family homes built with modern methods of construction, um, beautifully airtight, high energy performance, um, not on a heat network, unfortunately, but that maybe will solve that in the next phase. Um, you know they've been really popular. They're high density. They're you know they're selling well. I understand. Um, and so we think that people are accepting that if they want to live in the world, they'll live in a high density uh, area if they want a new house. Um, and we're supporting that through um, feasibility studies um, and, and funding to try and make sure that it actually happens because we probably going to need our land to, you know, absorb the intense water uh, events we're going to have or plant trees to soak up the carbon because we're still going to emit some carbon and we're going to need some, something to soak that up. Um, and, you know, a lot of leisure and, and um, tourism activities in the area as well. So 
it's it's an interesting stance and I will uh, have been watching how the local plan has been going but um, we are fully supportive of them and our brownfield land first approach. I'm glad you brought up sustainability though because obviously we have huge targets to meet. Everyone wants to be net zero by 2050. How are we going to get there? Construction has a big role to play in that. Um, Kieran, do you have any thoughts on how you know we as developers can be making that happen? We've got the new Part L, Part F build regs that are coming out at the moment to increase sustainability, but we really need to be dragging house builders to the table on this. Um, too often in the past, they're just quite happy to do the bare minimum, um, but they really need to be, we need to legislate to bring them forward. Um, house builders, um, easy to criticise them in some regards, and I, I won't defend them on some of the things they do, but, but if you look at house building, it's a manufacturing retail business. And within all sectors of manufacturing and retail, one of the core elements of that is product design, evolution, R&D. And for the house builders, if you look at in the main part what they did 20 years ago, it's much the same and it looks the same as it is now. I think we're at a tipping point um, with build cost inflation, uh, delivery on the ground, capacity of the workforce and environmental, and all those things that are going to come together. Um, I think modular and offsite. Um, fabrication, I think, as a key thing to look at in the, in the future, and it, it's quite disappointing, I suppose, if you look at the, the major volume house builders in the country and the cash that's available to them, and, and where are they pioneering, and, and where are they doing that off-site manufacturing, taking a, a leading role in that space? Um, you know, we've, this, the stats are falling out of all the trade publications right now in relation to 14% wage growth in construction cent sector, and we have an all-time high of. Um, vacancies in the construction sector, um, build cost materials forecast to increase 15-18%, timber is particularly chronic. How do we deal with all those things? Now in the past, um, off-site manufacture has always been more expensive, so it's just been left to the side, um, albeit with the best efforts of Homes England to drive that forward. But um, alongside that, you've also got the government who have recently announced the um, massive affordable housing package, and 25% of that is predicated on delivery of MMC. So there will be a big, big push into that space. Um, key players to look out for going forward, NG, they've got a 600,000 square foot factory up the M1. They've got a forward order book of, I think it's about 200 million. Recent key deal that they did down in Nottingham was a 650 unit scheme with Boots, Boots, the, the, their headquarters. From an ESG point of view, they wanted to do that deal with, with NG, purely because of that offside modular aspect. Uh, another one to look out for, Top Hat. Um, backed by Goldman Sachs. Now, if Goldman Sachs are back in uh, an off-site um, modular producer, that, that, that's a key um, player to watch. And then obviously, in our backyard, you've got the quality of Urban Splash and what they're doing at World, World Waters. So that whole build cost, ESG, sustainability piece, I think it's all gonna neatly come together. And uh, I think those that move quickest into that space and make it work at a viable level, I think they'll come out winners in that. Yeah, Sean, uh, Shannon or Colin, do you guys want to kind of sound off on what you guys are doing with your schemes? Um, yeah, and as, as a general point, I think the economics are so important. For a long time, there was a premium for anything that was regarded as green, and that you know people providing it felt they had to charge, um, but the people buying it didn't really want to pay for. Um, so the more we do of this, the more affordable it becomes, the better the technology becomes. So. Um, I don't know, our stuff is a mixture of conversion and new build, um, and so it's a little bit harder with some of the conversion stuffs to be a, stuff to be as sustainable as perhaps you would want to be. Um, but I agree with Kieran's point that so much of it is not so much the developer, it's everything that leads up to the developer, and it's the sourcing and specification of, of materials, deliveries, transport, and so on. And I'm optimistic about that. I think it's getting better and more efficient and cheaper. And the cheaper it gets, the more, the more we'll do it. At some, at some point, you know, it starts to affect viability in, in a way that it, it used to do. And viability is increasingly less affected by uh, sustainable products because they're just getting cheaper to make. Uh, Colin, we've got a question from you from the audience from Ben Roberts. Ben, where are you? There you are. Hi. Uh, he Hi wants to know if there's any lessons that can be learned from the collective going into administration last night. Like, do you think that co-living can continue to work in large-scale buildings? Yeah, there's a great lesson to be learned from the collective. Um, don't have 120 people in your head office. All right. <laughs> uh, so, you know, uh, I'm a big fan of what the collective used to do because they would develop, retain, manage. They did it to a high standard. Um, but 
co-living as a, as a relatively new concept in the modern sense is still kind of finding its feet. So you're always going to get some people who don't necessarily deliver the model um, in the most uh, permanent way, shall we, shall we say. And you see some uh, mergers, you see some failures, um, but very often it's the case that there, there are, if there's a failure, there's a specific reason for it. And sadly, in the collective case, they have 1,500 units across three buildings in England and another one in New York called the Paper Factory. And they have relatively tight teams in, on the, in the buildings, running the buildings, and a very elaborate and extravagant and expensive head office. So if you've got 1,500 units, do you really need 120 people in your head office? We have an 800 unit pipeline. I've got 12 people in my office. That's enough. Um, so, no, I think the collective is probably just an example of hubris on the part of a young and overfunded CEO. Yeah. Well, now that we've brought up administration, I know it's doom and gloom, so Dan, that's your territory. <laughs> Thank uh, you. <laughs> I, there people, it seems like there's a lot more options for investors than there used to be now when schemes go bust. Would you mind just elaborating a little bit more on what you've been working on? Yeah, sure. I, I mean, we did promise Tracy we wouldn't search on a certain developer in Liverpool, which we, we won't do. But um, yeah, sure. So we've got an overseas um, client base, and, and, and these schemes have been heavily targeted at, at those investors. And whether they've gone into an insolvent event, either whether they're part built or they're actually completed, I think that the guys in the panel have set out such a positive news story this morning and I, and I will do it in this respect as well because I think and as Shannon you and I've discussed we can leave all the fractional ownership schemes behind you know that, that's what everyone knows about them everyone knows that they are um, prejudicial to investors and they haven't worked um, and these things are being worked through what I, I would what I wanted to say this morning actually is that working in cooperation with the administrators and also local authorities and, and you know funders as well in respect of the schemes which have been built but have failed anyway, we've managed on behalf of groups of creditors to um, take control. So we've created companies, we've taken over um, property management, we've got control of the rent, the service charges, insurance, etc. And it's taken a, a difficult position to a much better one. So actually, it's quite they've been rescued. That's what I'd like really to say this morning as opposed to falling into insolvency and um, investors suffering losses and the schemes generally being outrageous, which they are, in my opinion, actually it's a rescue. And it, it's, it's the same with the uh, quite high profile um, insolvencies and administrations we're dealing with at the moment in Manchester, Liverpool, um, and throughout the country. Um, now, the, these schemes have failed before completion, but again, we've been able, with the cooperation of the key stakeholders, to actually rescue it as well by forming companies and actually buying the site from the administrators. So I think actually that there is a way forward in, in respect of insolvent developments generally. There might be more failures, you know, Kieran's mentioned, and I totally agree with it, the pressure on the supply chain and inflation and wage costs, etc. I think that's inevitable. Um, but in respect of the specific uh, developments that we know and love really, then actually I think it's, we're getting to a, towards a much better story and it's a, it's a rescue. All right, well, I'm gonna to get to George, George Isle's question. I'm gonna, George, uh, sorry, I have not been ignoring you. I see you've got two in the top one, but I'm gonna tackle the second one here. Is outdoor space and home working slash schooling space now adding more value to units since COVID? Will this impact the layout of houses and use of space? So, Shannon. You made eye contact slightly for two seconds, so this is coming to you. Um, it's difficult. So I'm talking from a BTR perspective, and we see the influx of people coming back into the, the city centres. I could say um, BTR is proving to be outperforming the traditional BTL sector, but both are performing really well as people are coming back into the city centre. BTR tend to have more outside space and that, that flexibility, but because we're getting the effect of uh, reurbanisation, I can't say for sure that's what's um, you know driving one against the other. Yeah. So speaking to the volume house builders, um, COVID lockdown during that period when things were starting to open in the, in, in the sales cabins, and they were overwhelmed with people. 
um, evaluating the value of the houses that they had. Like I said, moving that bit further afield to make their market, to, to, to make their pound go that little bit further for more space and that little extra bedroom for the study. Mm -hmm. So yeah, most definitely. Now, now bring it to a higher level um, with the house builders, they see a much um, greater value now in real investment in soft landscaping and, and play areas and infrastructure. And they, see, they actually now see the added benefit of that. Where it used to be lip service, do the absolute minimum, they really want to put time and investment into that and, and really put it at the heart of the master plan. And, and that is squarely off the, what they hear from consumers as they walk in through the sales cabins. And I know, you know, kind of listening to what the consumers want is an aspect of BTR and co-living. You guys have, like, it feels like an amenities race. You know, we have Zoom rooms, you have pools, gyms, all that jazz. How does that fit into, you know, making a scheme, Colin? Um, well, I'm totally on board with the outside space thing. We, we insist on in balconies, even though they can be expensive, they add at least as much value as they cost or they ought to. Um, and I hate to see a flat roof. All flat roofs should be terraces, whether they're office buildings or apartment buildings or, I don't know, warehouses, I don't care. You, you know, people, people like being outside, you, you know, and especially in urban environments, you need to give them as much outside space as possible. Um, that in itself is an amenity, and that would always be top of my list. Um, the others, the internal spaces, um, we have an ongoing conversation in the office about people expect to see it. It's not BTR and it certainly isn't co-living unless you provide amenities. One of the principal differences between the two is that most BTR schemes will have between 2 and 4% of their floor area uh, for amenity. In the operating co-living model, we have 35%. There's a dramatic difference. That then begs the question, what are you doing with this 35%? The answer in our model is that the majority of that is split across giving amenity spaces to each and every floor. Um, so those are dedicated to those floors. In addition, we have the roof terraces and then we have the basement ground and first floor spaces. So then it comes down to, well, the amenities on each and all floor are dead straightforward. They're kind of family dining room, kitchen spaces, TV rooms and quiet rooms for studying. But you know, to go to Tracy's point, they're also sort of subdivided, so not everybody is in the same space at the same time. So then you are left with the question of what do you do on the very lowest floors? There's some obvious stuff, co-working, um, gym, maybe a cinema. Um, but beyond that, when people start talking about wet areas, you know, swimming pools and spas and so on, the, the, the problem we find with the wet areas is they're eye-wateringly expensive to build. They're very expensive to, to run. If you do what we do, which is we keep everything, I don't have anybody to send a service charge invoice to because if the pool needs fixing, I have to pay to fix it from my gross rental income. Do I, do I really want that level of high expenditure for an amenity that not everybody is going to use? So the, the, there's a building in, um, in the northern quarter, I don't know, it's 20 stories or something, and there's a swimming pool on the top, and I know a few people who live in that building, I speak to them, and they've never been there. It looks lovely on the marketing, it looks lovely on the website, they can tell their mates they've got a swimming pool on the 20th floor, but they don't go. And swimming pools are you know, a health and safety nightmare as well. So I would suggest that you just deliver the stuff that people will actually use. That's not necessarily a pool. And if you want to do a cinema, unless you've got a very large scheme of 300 units plus where you could probably justify a dedicated one. I'd be doing an event space which can become a cinema as, as and when you want it to be. Because you'll find, that particularly in the larger buildings, and I know, funnily enough, this was the experience of the uh, collective, um, and I know this because one of their senior execs is sitting over there and now works for me, um, is that the, um, the way in which those spaces are used are quite modular in the sense if you've got 500 people living in a building, 50 will always go to the gym, 100 may use it occasionally, 350 never go. And the same is true with the cinema or the Zoom rooms or anything else. You're actually providing these spaces for a for relatively small percentage of the population to use. So I think the answer is a flexible space, an event space, which could be a Zoom room if you wanted it, could be a cinema if you wanted it, could be a private dining room if you wanted it to be. So, so you don't have to over-provide, you just have to provide the right stuff, I think, in a flexible way. And of course, where you're not providing immunity, you're leaving floor area left over for rentable space. So it's, it's a win-win in the sense you've got lots of spaces which people are using, and space that wouldn't have been used is producing revenue. Yeah. Shannon? I think, yes, I 
definitely the flexible space. It's about getting the building to work because the efficiency, especially with rising build costs, is absolutely imperative. So you've got to get your money's worth. And the tenants need to feel like they are able to use each space. If you've got a swimming pool and you don't use it, and you haven't used it for six months, you might think, I'm paying too much rent here. I need to go somewhere else, you know. Um, so it's wasted money. What I would say about amenity as well, it's about um, the location your scheme is in. Um, and where you're fitting into the marketplace. So BTR isn't always, you know, in a prime spot in a city centre where you're pushing for the rents and you, you, it, it's all bells or whistles. So where we're moving forward now is looking, and this is following a, it's tried and tested, it's a multifamily model. So looking at larger sites. So no longer are we looking at the sort of golden 250 to 300 unit BTR site. We're looking bigger we've just exchanged on something which is over 600 units and there it'll be one funder but three different branded BTR so one won't have any immunity in at all um, and that will be a more um, focused at people for a lower rent um, one will have you know the the lounges and there'll be another one which will be more premium but will be branded very differently you wouldn't know it was the same fund that were operating it but key to it, and although the one hasn't got the amenity, is public realm in the middle. So even though you haven't got the amenity, you have got some public realm and green space where you know you can um, be outside, it's river facing. But I would say key to BTR, it's the amenities that bring people through the door, but what keeps them in BTR, and this is absolute key, is the service and the management and having BTR for me is not about amenities, it's about a professionally um, managed rental product and knowing when there's a problem with your fridge, you can phone up and you can get it sorted straight away. Um, it's having somebody there, a, a, a parcel storage, it's having that management and just a really good quality of service. So what we're finding in the market is people will move out of a BTR scheme within six months they're back in because they've got used to that standard of service. On the flip side, if you manage it badly, if you've got bad managers, there's now um, it's a trip advisor for BTR Home Views. It will be on there. It's so key. It's so key the management of these schemes. Um, so with all the amenities in the world, if you've got bad reviews and a bad experience, um, it, the scheme is done for. Yeah. yeah, live and die by Yelp. Uh, so we do have a couple questions here that are all about. Uh, housing for those who are 55 and older. So I'm just going to jump to those. So Lauren Gittins wants to know, do you think adding a provision for the type of development on a site within the local plans would help certain types of development to the housing stock for those who are 55 and up? Um, Tracy, would you sound off on this? <laughs> um, I think a, a few of the planning authorities have, have tried that. And to be perfectly honest, I, I don't think it's worked. Um, and I think what we're saying about flexibility, you know, um, as an over 55, I look at quite a lot of developments and it's like, oh, this is targeted to over 55. And I think, oh, do I really want to live with a bunch of over 55 year olds? Um, and, you know, quite honestly, no, I don't, I, don't want to, I don't want to have that tag because I don't want people to know, although I've just owned up. Um, and uh, I do want to live in a, in a mixed community because you know, I don't just want to associate with over 55 year olds. Um, so I think it's building the right um, mix of houses and you know, an over 55's house you know, would be appropriate for a family as well as, as we were all, all saying earlier. Um, I think some of the local authorities are trying to get in policies about you know, bungalows and I, I worked with the local authority before that had that requirement and I think they managed to do like eight bungalows in uh, you know three years. The policy clearly didn't work. Everybody said viability. Nobody wants to build a bungalow um, because it's too space hungry and it's, it's expensive and, and you know they don't have a standard housing, housing type for that so it's difficult to price when you're you know buying the land and working out viability and that sort of thing. Um, so I think I think what will drive it, uh, and much more, is we are seeing more legislation to drive that type of thing. So I think the changes to Part M on accessibility will make most housing more appropriate for older people. But when you remember it's about accessibility, you know, um, when you have a buggy, 
it's you know and a young child you still need that accessibility because you're still pushing somebody in a vehicle into your house and it's difficult carrying them up the stairs so um i think planning has has some role to play but i don't think it's the entire answer mm -hmm. kieran do you agree yes but up to a point i do think over 55s need a bit of a helping hand in terms of getting access to land in a super competitive market. Mm -hmm. In the last two years, I, I haven't seen land price inflation like in my career. And whenever you're trying to find, find space for that form of development in a super competitive market, uh, an interventionist approach to try and at least allocate land in some shape or form within a local plan, I think that would be useful. All right, we're now on for our final question and I'm gonna pull my chair power and let it be mine. Uh, so, f this is for every single one on the panel, so get your thinking caps on. Where do you see Resi at in 10 years? Where's, what's going to be hot, what's going to be not? Uh, and Karen, I'm just going to keep going with you. I'll bounce on from something I said earlier. I think the biggest house builder in 10 years' time could be somebody that we've never heard of. Somebody that uh, enters MMC with real vigor and investment. And I'm saying that historically in terms of where the unicorns have come from, the Amazons and the apples of this world. Somebody that really grabs that by the, the nuts, shall we say, um, <laughs> then aggressively goes and takes over possibly a PLC house builder purely for their land bank and re-energizes the whole organization in terms of how they deliver. Possibly, I don't know. The other thing, um, driverless cars and how they affect how we design both suburban and urban. I think that's huge. Um, um, we haven't even started that conversation yet. So, I, so if you're talking in a very futuristic 10 years time, those are my two things, yeah. All right, Dan, any thoughts? Um, with respect to Karen, I, I couldn't look more than two years ahead <laughs> at the moment. With the harbinger of doom half the past time again, we, you know, we've got this debt burden I've mentioned, the, the, the other issues we, we discussed about that we need to work through and come through. I, w I would look at it from a one or two year perspective. And from my view, there's going to be continued um, space available. The bricks and mortar are available from retail. Retail, uh, you know, it, I think uh, Colin mentioned this at the start of this session. It's the pandemic has accelerated what was already happening. So, and we're seeing it not just the high-profile um, insolvencies, but it's, it's across the board that retail space in city centres, towns, market towns, whatever, will become available. And it's, I suppose, how it's repurposed in a with sufficient quality. But that, that's why I think it's going in the, in the short term. Tracy, can you uh, do 10 years? Or if you need to do one to two, that's fine too. <laughs> I'll be retired in 10 years, so I won't be here Ooh. to have to justify what I'm going to say about uh, what's happening <laughs> in 10 years to keep the older theme. Um, I hope that we will have embraced net zero carbon and that people will be heating and using their homes and their homes and their cars because the potential for your electric vehicle car battery storage to actually at times power your house and at times you know take power from your house uh, I think that flexibility with the air so I really hope we see lots more innovation in that area and that arena awesome Shannon um, I think the professional rental sector um, will just go from strength to strength and I know um, did a visit to the states five years ago and they, their minds were blown by the way our rental sector worked. They just couldn't understand it. And it was a bit of a light bulb moment for, for me and my colleagues that were there, seeing that actually there you just build a block for rent or your block for sale. And uh, that's the only way you can, you can manage the rental sector. You wouldn't have the Trafford Centre with lots of individual landlords. It's absolutely ridiculous. And it's the same for the residential sector. So I think we will just progress further and further down that model and that will become the norm. Um, just picking up on sustainability, I would love to see in 10 years something that is more effective than an EPC rating mm. that we can put against the development. Um, at the moment we, we measure everything to Letty because it's embodied and operational carbon and we've hit those standards on Vox. But we'd love to have something, you know, your punter on the street doesn't know what Letty is. Um, but it's such an amazing achievement and we would like people to, to see that and be able to gauge and make choices based on that. But my final thing, and I'll always mention it on any uh, residential panel or round table, is, is cladding and the absolute sitting time bomb that the cladding problem is, um, is presenting. So if it's not fixed or government don't make a more sizable intervention into that, um, 
there's thousands of people in the city centres who are just sitting there who can't move. And in the next 10 years, it could actually blow up or it'll get sorted. So I think that needs to be top of any government's agenda and Michael Gove's agenda. All right, Colin, and I know we're going to have to end soon because already the low battery sign came up, always a sign of doom and gloom. <laughs> yeah. So, Colin, what do you think the future will be? Um, I, I can be quick. I mean, I'm not expecting any great revolutions. Ten years is two general elections. It's probably a recession. It's two U.S. elections. Um, but I think the themes are already set. We've talked about net zero. We've talked about sustainability. Um, I like to talk about fragmentation and variation. I agree with Shannon about, you know, we have to have... More, more of that. I'm very optimistic about the fact that we're producing ever better research projects, ever higher quality architecture, ever more sustainable products and, and processes. Um, so I think 10 years from now, we should see something which is of, of an ever higher quality, of a greater choice for people. Um, and, and actually, slightly comes back to this over 55 thing. I'd like to get rid of this over 55 thing. We, we have buildings where people are 18, 69, you know, 52, whatever, whatever it might be. So why just lump anybody into that plus 55 thing? And all that's not really the answer to your question. My, my point is that we want to be able to offer as much choice to as many people on an affordable basis as possible and let them decide how they live. And I think we're absolutely on track to do that. And that 10 years from now, we'll be so much further on in that regard than we are now. That's a lot of food for thought. Can I get a round of applause for our panel, please? Colin, Shannon, Kiernan, Dan, and Tracy, thank you guys so much. You guys were fantastic. I also want to thank, before we head on out, our sponsors again, who, again, made all of this possible. That would be Oppid in Life, BECG, Clear Fiber, Close Brothers Property Finance, Trowers and Hamlins, and WSP. And if you haven't had a chance yet to chat with the folks of G Builder, do so because they've got a really interesting product that can really help a lot of schemes in the area. Thank you again so much. I'm going to let you go and have lunch because I don't know about you. I am starving. So uh, thank you again. Have a good rest of your day.